In the previous lesson, I mentioned that we'll want to be able to solve certain kinds of quadratic equations which are motivated by questions about the graphs of quadratic functions. For example, if we're trying to find the places where a parabola crosses the x-axis, we call those the x-intercepts. So in today's lesson, I want to spend time talking about solving quadratic equations using one of the most important and useful tools for this job. It's called factoring. So let's get started with a problem that starts out talking about parabolas, but quickly moves into an algebraic equation. So here's the example. I want us to determine the x-intercepts of the parabola whose equation is f of x equals 10x squared minus 8x. Okay, so let's make sure we understand what we're trying to find. The x-intercepts of any graph are the points where the graph crosses the x-axis. So that means these are the points that have a y-coordinate of zero. If you're sitting on the x-axis in the xy-plane, then your y-coordinate must be zero. So if I'm trying to find x-intercepts, I want to set the whole function equal to zero and solve for x. And that means I can translate this question about graphs and so on into solving this equation. 10x squared minus 8x equals zero. Now, we want to factor this quadratic that's on the left-hand side as much as possible in order to find these x-intercepts. And the first rule of factoring in these kinds of problems is to factor out the greatest common factor on the left-hand side. In fact, this is always the first thing you want to do when you're factoring, to look for the biggest factor that's in common on the left-hand side, in this case, and factor that out, okay? So when I look at 10x squared and 8x, I want to know what factors or terms do those have in common? Clearly, they both have an x in them, right? There's an x squared, so that's got some x's in it, and there's an 8x that has an x in it as well. So I would be able to factor that x out from both terms. That's a start. Now, what about the numbers or the constants? What can be factored out of a 10 and an 8 at the same time? Well, both 10 and 8 are even, so I know I can factor out a 2, and if I factor a 2 out of the 10, that's going to leave a 5 there, and if I factor a 2 out of the 8, it's going to leave a 4. So I would have a 5 and a 4. What can I factor out of both of those at the same time? Well, of course, you could factor out a 1, but that doesn't really help us. In fact, 5 and 4 don't have any other factors in common other than that 1, which doesn't do us any good. So the greatest common factor on the left-hand side of that equation is actually 2 times x. And so now what I'm going to suggest is that we factor that out and see what happens. The original equation we had was 10x squared minus 8x equals 0. If we factor the 2x out, I would have the following, 2x times the quantity 5x minus 4, and now all of that equals 0. Now, you might say to me, how in the world do I know if that's really the right factorization? So before we go any further, let me just mention this one thing. If you're not sure that you've factored correctly, you can always stop and re-multiply or redistribute the terms and see if you get back where you started. In this case, you could take the 2x times the 5x, and that gives you 10x squared, and you could take the 2x times the negative 4, and that gives you negative 8x. And that's what you started with before. So you're guaranteed that the factorization is correct. 2x times 5x minus 4 equals 0. Now, there's an amazingly important rule, which you've probably used for a number of years already, that I'm going to use now in order to finish this problem. If you multiply two real numbers together and their product equals zero, then one or both of those numbers that you multiplied together must have been zero by itself. Now, how do you use that in this problem? Well, look, if 2x times 5x minus 4 equals zero, then this rule tells me that either the 2x equals 0 or the 5x minus 4 equals 0. 
And now what I've done is I've split this problem into two smaller problems, two smaller equations, and oh, by the way, those two equations, 2x equals 0 and 5x minus 4 equals 0, are easier because they're just linear equations. And you and I have solved linear equations already in this course. So let's solve those two equations separately and then interpret our answers. 2x equals 0 can be solved into, or simplified to, I should say, x equals 0 if you just divide both sides by 2. 2x divided by 2 is just 1x, or x, and 0 divided by 2 is still 0. So the first equation comes up with a solution of x equals 0. What about the second one? Well, 5x minus 4 equals 0 can be converted to 5x equals 4 by just adding 4 to both sides. And if you divide by a 5, you then get x equals 4 fifths. So we now have our answer. Let's just make sure we interpret it correctly. The x-intercepts of the parabola, whose equation is given by f of x equals 10x squared minus 8x, are the points 0 comma 0 and 4 fifths comma 0. And the focus here is on the x-coordinates of those two points. Remember, the solutions we found were x equals 0 and x equals 4 fifths. So the two intercepts on the x-axis are 0 comma 0 and 4 fifths comma 0. Now, we should really confirm that these answers make sense. And to do so, we could do one or maybe two things. We could either plug in 0 and plug in 4 fifths for x in the original function and then see if the output value is 0. That would be fine, and that's actually a very algebraic way to solve that, or to check that. But the other thing we could do, which is more graphical, is this. We could sketch the graph of f of x equals 10x squared minus 8x, and we could actually look to see about where the x-intercepts are. And if you do this, I think it's a great way to try to check. It may not be the most foolproof way to check, but it's a nice visual way to check to see if you've got the right answers. So here's a graph of f of x equals 10x squared minus 8x. It should be pretty obvious if you look at that that one of the x-intercepts is at the origin. You can see the graph going right through that origin. But what about the other x-intercept? It looks like it's just less than 1, and that makes sense with an answer like 4 fifths, because 4 fifths is slightly less than 1. And for our purposes right now, it's not a perfect check, but it's close enough. I'm satisfied that we've got the right answer. If you want something that's more airtight, the only way you can confirm 100% that we've got the right answer is to plug 0 in for x in the original function and see if 0 comes out, and to plug in 4 fifths for x into the original function and see if 0 comes out. If you do that, you're guaranteed that we've got the right answers. Now, let's move to another type of factoring situation. So the first example I just did was motivated by a graph. Now I want to do an example or two that's not really motivated by a graph. I just want to go right to the algebra, and I want to solve some quadratic equations. So here's the first example like that that I want to do. Let's solve x squared plus 18 equals 11x. Okay. The first thing you want to do with any equation like this is to get all of the terms on one side. It's often helpful to have that happen. We'll break that rule a little bit in a couple lessons, and I'll explain why at that time. But for now, let's start by getting all the terms to one side, and I'm going to suggest we get them all to the left-hand side in this example. If I subtract 11x over to the left-hand side, I'm going to have x squared minus 11x plus 18 equals 0. Now the solutions of this equation are identical to the solutions of the original equation. So now let's just focus on this new equation. Remember the first rule of factoring. Factor out the greatest common factor. You always need to do that first. Unfortunately, the greatest common factor of these three terms is actually just a 1, and factoring out a 1 doesn't help me. So although it was good to remember to do that first, I need to just move on because that step really doesn't help in this problem. Now the next thing I want to do to factor this quadratic is to write out what I know. What I know is that it's going to factor as something like x minus or plus something times 
x minus or plus something else. And those will both be in their own set of parentheses. Okay? But now I need to figure out what the signs are going to be after each of those x's. Will they be a plus or will they be a minus? Maybe they're both plus, maybe they're both minus, maybe there's a mixture. Well, in this case, in order to get that plus 18 as my constant term, as opposed to a negative 18, I'm going to need the same signs after each x. And in order to get an 11x, or I should say a negative 11x, I'm going to need those signs to be negative. So they need to be the same sign in both sets of parentheses. And because I have a negative 11x as the middle term in the quadratic, I need both signs to be negative. So now I know that my factored form looks like x minus blank, let's say, times x minus another blank. And now I need to fill in those two blanks with some sort of numbers. And now I've got to start doing a little bit of arithmetic, maybe either in my head or on a piece of scratch paper over to the side. Whatever numbers I put into those blanks have to satisfy two rules or two facts. First, the product of those two numbers that I plug in has to be the 18, the constant term. And secondly, the sum of those two numbers needs to be 11. Now, there are lots of choices for the numbers that you could multiply together to get 18. For example, you could do 18 times 1. But 18 times 1, even though its product is 18, the sum is 19, which isn't 11. I need it to be 11. OK, we could try 6 and 3. 6 times 3 is 18, cool, but 6 plus 3, ah, that's only 9. I need 11. What two numbers can I pick so that the product is 18 and the sum is 11? Well, if you pause for a second, why don't we try 9 and 2? Because 9 times 2 is 18, and 9 plus 2 is 11. And that tells me what my factorization needs to be. It's going to be x minus 9 times x minus 2, and then, of course, that was equal to 0 when I rewrite the equation. Now, I've got the product of two things, x minus 9 times x minus 2 equaling 0. Anytime two things multiplied together equal 0, I know that one or the other, or both, have to equal 0. And that means I can split this thing into x minus 9 equals 0 or x minus 2 equals 0. And of course, if you just add the right amounts to both sides of those, those are the same as saying x equals 9 or x equals 2. Now, I claim that these are the two solutions of the original equation, which we started with a few minutes ago. So I want to check that now by plugging them into the original equation and making sure I get some true statements at the end. So here we go. The very original equation was x squared plus 18 equals 11x. Let's plug in 9, which I claim is one of the solutions, and let's just make sure everything works out. 9 squared plus 18 equals 11 times 9. That's what I would be saying. That's the same as 81 plus 18 equals 99. And of course, that's saying 99 equals 99. That's a true statement, so that's good. That tells me 9 really is a solution. Let's now try the 2. I'm going to plug 2 in for x, and that's going to give me 2 squared plus 18 equals 11 times 2, which is 4 plus 18 equals 22, which is 22 equals 22, and that's also true. So we've confirmed that x equals 9 and x equals 2 are the two solutions of the original equation. Solving quadratic equations by factoring takes a good bit of practice. So let's look at a few other examples of this kind just to try to give you that practice as we walk through this lesson. Let me suggest that you try this one on your own first. Solve the equation 2x squared plus 8x minus 20 equals 5x. OK, that's a tough one. Let's do it together and see if you came up with what I'm about to show you. It is kind of difficult because of that extra 2, but we can do this. One of the basic rules about algebra and math in general is to try to do things as often as possible in the same way, sort of like following a recipe in your kitchen. Once you've got a good thing going, 
You don't want to change it up. And the same is true about quadratic equations. So first things first, let's move all the terms over to one side. I'm going to suggest we move them over to the left-hand side. And that gives us 2x squared plus 8x minus 5x minus 20 equals 0. If you combine the 8x and the 5x, you'll actually have plus 3x. And so what you're really looking at is 2x squared plus 3x minus 20 equals 0. Now, remember the next step should always be factor out the greatest common factor if there is one. In this case, since that 3x is odd and the other two terms, the other two numbers are even, there's no common number that we can factor out. And that 20 on the end by itself without any x's tells us that there aren't any x's to factor out either as part of a greatest common factor. So I keep telling you to try a greatest common factor and to factor it out, and we keep running into examples where there isn't one. I can promise there will be some <laughs> in later examples. So just bear with me as I keep making us go through that step. Okay, what next? Well, let's start writing out these parentheses like we did in the previous example. This time, they are not going to look like an x with a blank times another x with a blank. Why not? Well, because if all you put into the first parenthesis is an x, and all you put into the second parenthesis is another x, then you're just going to have 1x squared when you multiply those two terms together. But you need 2x squared in this example. So the opening step that we want here is to actually write two sets of empty parentheses. And in the first one, we're going to put a 2x. And in the second one, we're going to put an x. So when I multiply those two together, I would actually have 2x squared. And that's a good start. Now, the next thing we want to do is to think about how we're going to get a negative 20 when we multiply the constants together that we want to stick into those two sets of parentheses. Well, we're going to need to have 1 plus in there, and we're also going to need to have 1 minus sign. And that's because when you multiply a positive number with a negative number, you get a negative number back, and you want negative 20. So we really are going to want a plus and a minus, one in one set of parentheses and one in another. But which one is going to go with the 2x, and which one is going to go with the x? To be honest with you, off the top of my head right now, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But we can play this game of juggling these facts together until we get it figured out. Now, whatever we put in for those two constants, we're going to need to get a 3x for the middle term. And it's going to have to be a positive 3x. Now, you've got lots of choices to make for what you're going to plug in for those numbers. They need to multiply together to give you negative 20. And somehow, we need to get a 3x as the middle term. So I'm going to suggest something that might find, you might find a little surprising. I'm going to suggest we just try plugging some numbers in and seeing if the factorization is correct. Seriously, sometimes in mathematics, you just have to try and see if what you did worked. So let me make this suggestion. Let's plug a negative 10 in to the set of first parentheses, or the first set of parentheses, and let's plug a plus 2 into that second set of parentheses. That would give me 2x minus 10 times x plus 2. Now, if you multiply that out and it's correct as the factorization, then we should get what it is we want, which is 2x squared plus 3x minus 20. So let's multiply this out and see what we get. Well, you'll have 2x minus 10 times x plus 2. And when you multiply that all out, you're going to have a 2x squared plus a 4x. That comes from 2x times 2. And then you're going to have a minus 10x, which comes from the negative 10 times the x. And then you're going to have a negative 20, which comes from the negative 10 times the positive 2. Well, that's looking pretty good. The 2x squared you want and the negative 20 you want. The terms in the middle, 4x minus 10x, actually gives you negative 6x. Ah, that's close, but it's not what we want. What I wanted was a plus 3x in the middle, not a negative 6x. What does that mean? 
It means the choice of the numbers that I picked earlier, the negative 10 and the positive 2, were wrong. Okay, well, we could keep guessing. And I would suggest you do that until you get sort of practiced at trying to figure out what these numbers are. But let me give you a hint. Let's try this instead. 2x minus 5 times x plus 4. Now, let's just critically think about this for a second. First of all, I needed one of the numbers to be negative and one of them to be positive. I've done that. I needed the two numbers to multiply together to give me negative 20. Negative 5 times positive 4 is negative 20. So I know I'm good there. Now let's try multiplying this thing out together and see if we get the right polynomial. 2x minus 5 times x plus 4 would be 2x squared from the 2x times x plus the 8x from the 2x times the 4 minus the 5x from the minus 5 times the x and then minus a 20 times the negative with from the negative 5 times a positive 4. When you combine all that together, you'll have 2x squared plus 3x, 8x minus 5x is plus 3x, minus 20. And that's what you wanted. And that means we have factored the left-hand side of our equation correctly. And so our equation can now be written in the following way. 2x squared plus 3x minus 20 equals 0 is the same as 2x minus 5 times x plus 4 equals 0. And remember this splitting trick we can now do. When you have two things multiplied together to equal 0, then you can split them into the first one equals 0 or the second one equals 0. So I have 2x minus 5 equals 0 or x plus 4 equals 0. And that's the same as saying 2x equals 5 or x equals negative 4. And if in the first one you divide by a 2, it's the same as saying x equals 5 halves or x equals negative 4. And that means I now know my solutions. They are 5 halves and they are negative 4. Now, before I move to another example, let's make a couple quick comments. First, there's definitely lots of other choices for what we might have put into those parentheses, and I understand that completely. And so, you just need to know up front that some of these problems can take a while. Just be patient and walk through your choices. Secondly, I want you to notice that x plus 4 equals 0 led to the solution x equals negative 4. I've known a number of students who incorrectly conclude that if x plus 4 equals 0, then x must equal positive 4. But that would be wrong, because if you plug in positive 4 for x into the equation x plus 4 equals 0, then you're going to have 4 plus 4 equals 0, or 8 equals 0. And that's just wrong. So remember that you need to switch the sign on the solution the way we did above. If you know that x plus 4 equals 0, then x has to equal negative 4. Let me actually make one more comment before we keep moving. It's going to be very important that your, let's call them arithmetic skills, are up to speed in order to do the factoring of these problems quickly. I needed to know in my head that I had to multiply two numbers to get 20. That means I need to know, okay, 20 times 1, and 10 times 2, and 5 times 4, and so on. I need to know that all of those equal 20 pretty quickly. You're going to want to have that kind of multiplication and addition facts in your head so that you can do them as quickly as possible. It might be good for you to actually spend some time reviewing some of those arithmetic facts before moving forward with these factoring examples because it will really help you in the long run as you're trying to keep juggling. Is these two numbers multiplied here and these two numbers have to be added there? Knowing how to do that quickly will be very important. Now, we could probably spend the next 30 minutes doing examples of factoring. It's very important, and these kinds of problems show up quite often. But for now, I want to move on to a slightly different and very special kind of factoring which is called difference of two squares. So let me show you this with this example. Solve the equation 3x squared equals 48. Okay, let's go through this problem as we have with the previous ones and do the same steps over and over, because as I said, it's like following a recipe. So the first thing we need to do, do you know what it is? You need to subtract that 48 to the left-hand side so that everything gets on the left-hand side. 
and you'll be left with 3x squared minus 48 equals 0. That's the first step. Second step, factor out the greatest common factor. And in this case, I've given us an example where there really is a greatest common factor to factor out. It's 3 in this case, because 3 divides the 3 in front of the x squared, and it also divides 48. And that means I now have 3 times the quantity x squared minus 16 equals 0. Now, because I have everything equal to 0, I can now divide that 3 on both sides, and on the left, it just goes away, because 3 divided by 3 is 1. And on the right side, I would have 0 over 3, which is just 0. So what I'm left with is x squared minus 16 equals 0. It's basically like I just canceled out a 3. It, you might think it's sort of mysterious, like I just erased the 3. I didn't just do that. I actually divided it out on both sides, and it goes away on the left, and the 0 on the right basically annihilates it. So now I'm down to x squared minus 16 equals 0. Now what? Well, I want you to notice that the x squared is a perfect square because it's just x times x. And also notice that 16 is a perfect square since it's 4 times 4. So x squared minus 16 is what I call a difference of two squares. Remember, difference is talking about subtraction. So x squared minus 16 is a difference of two squares. And here's a really cool fact about those kinds of things. Differences of two squares always factor the same way. In this case, it would be x minus 4 times x plus 4. And if you don't believe me, multiply this out, and you'll see that you get x squared minus 16. So it turns out that our new equation can now be written as x minus 4 times x plus 4 equals 0. It's that simple. And using the fact that we already used a few times in this lesson, I can now split that into two smaller linear equations, x minus 4 equals 0, or x plus 4 equals 0. And that means that the two solutions come out quickly as either x equals 4 or x equals negative 4. Now, it turns out that the original equation could have been solved in a different way using square roots instead of using this factoring with a difference of two squares. I'm going to save that for a later lesson. We'll talk about working that kind of a problem out with square roots later. But let's close this lesson with a word problem that gets us thinking about solving quadratic equations in a somewhat real-world setting. Here's the example. Suppose you have a rectangular garden which measures 10 feet by 8 feet. You want to actually expand the garden by, let's say, x feet in each direction so that you keep it rectangular. You can think of this as a new border around the old garden. And you want to plant flowers in this border section, and the labels on the flowers say that they'll fill an area that's 88 square feet. The question is, how wide should you make the border? In other words, what should x be to give you the correct dimensions of this border of your garden? Now, let me ask you a question. What's a formula for finding the area of that border? Well, notice that the border naturally breaks into several pieces of area. There are four square pieces on the corners, and those are going to be x squared square feet in area. And there are also four rectangular pieces on the borders, and they each have 10x, 8x, 10x, and 8x square feet respectively. So the sum total of all of these pieces of area is going to be 4x squared for each of the four corners. So when you add those up, you get 4x squared, plus 36x for the rectangular pieces on the sides. Now this equals the total area of the border, and we were told that the flowers would take up 88 square feet. So I basically want the solutions of this equation. 4x squared plus 36x equals 88. And now we're back to the kind of problems that we've been looking at for the last several minutes. So let me suggest this. Why don't you try solving that equation? 4x squared plus 36x equals 88. Well, how'd you do? Did you get it? Well, let's just work it through together. Moving that 88 over to the left-hand side gives me 
4x squared plus 36x minus 88 equals 0. And if I factor out a common factor of 4, I'll have 4 times the quantity x squared plus 9x minus 22 equals 0. The 4 will be canceled out when I divide it from both sides, leaving me x squared plus 9x minus 22 equals 0. And that happens to factor as x plus 11 times x minus 2 equals 0. And that could be split into x plus 11 equals 0 or x minus 2 equals 0. So what are our solutions? They are x equals negative 11 and x equals 2. Now, before we say we're done, we ought to think for just a second critically about these answers. What does this x value represent in this problem? Well, it's the width of this border in feet. What does that mean about the solutions? Well, does negative 11 make sense? Absolutely not. You can't have a negative width for this garden. And that means that we should just throw out the x equals negative 11 in this problem. And we need to then make the border of our garden exactly x equals 2 feet wider. And we'll be done. Next time, I'd like to look at a new tool for solving certain types of quadratic equations. That's what we've been doing today. But I want to look at a new tool for doing so. And it involves computing square roots. So you might want to review a few facts about square roots before we move on to the next lesson. In our previous lesson, we began to look at ways to solve quadratic equations by discussing some different factoring techniques. In today's lesson, I want to talk about another tool for solving quadratic equations, square roots. Before we jump right into the examples of solving quadratic equations with square roots, I'd like to make sure that you and I are on the same page when it comes to square roots. So really quickly, let's do a couple of square root examples. Of course, it's easier to see how to do some of these examples if you know some of the perfect square facts, like 1 squared equals 1, and 2 squared equals 4, 3 squared equals 9, 4 squared equals 16, and so on. In fact, I would suggest that you memorize these from 1 squared up to 12 squared if you haven't already done so. Okay, let's look at our first example then of just simplifying some square roots before we actually get to solving quadratic equations using square roots. So here's the example. Simplify square root of 45. Okay, this actually goes pretty quickly as long as we know some rules related to square roots. So let me march through this one step at a time to make sure that we see how to do it. Square root of 45 equals the square root of 9 times 5. You're always allowed underneath the square root symbol to factor the number that's there. So I'm allowed to have 9 times 5 underneath that square root symbol. And the square root of 9 times 5 is the same as square root of 9 times square root of 5. In other words, I can take the square root of a product and make it into the product of two square roots. So I've literally split square root of 9 times 5 into the square root of 9 times the square root of 5. That's perfectly legal. And once I've done that, I can start to work on each of those two square roots separately. In the case of square root of 9, I know that that's equal to 3. And in the case of square root of 5, I can't really do much. So this now simplifies to 3 times square root of 5. And in fact, that can't be simplified any further. So that's my final answer. Okay, so I've just used a very important fact that I'm just going to repeat again. I'm always allowed to split the square root of a product, or two things being multiplied, into the product of two square roots. It turns out that the same is true of quotients, or two numbers being divided by one another. For example, the square root of 8 thirds is the same as the square root of 8 divided by square root of 3. So I can do it with products. I can split square roots of products. I can also split the square root of a quotient or the square root of a fraction into two square roots. 
But it's important that we remember that such a rule is not true for sums or differences. For example, it is not true that the square root of 9 plus 7 is the same as the square root of 9 plus the square root of 7. And it's also not true that the square root of 9 minus 7 is the same as the square root of 9 minus the square root of 7. These are traps that I've seen numerous college students fall into all the time. I've been teaching for a long time, and I watch those two errors show up all the time. So please avoid them. You can split square roots when things are multiplied together, and you can split square roots when you have a fraction, but you cannot split square roots when the two pieces are either being added or subtracted. Okay, so now let me suggest that you try simplifying a square root on your own. So here's one. Simplify the negative of square root of 81 divided by 49. Well, how'd you do? Well, let's walk through it together and see. We know from what I just said that we can break this problem into two separate square roots and rewrite square, negative square root of 81 over 49 as negative square root of 81 divided by square root of 49. So far, so good. Now, if you know some facts about squares, you know that 81 is 9 squared and 49 is 7 squared. I picked those two numbers pretty carefully. And that means that our new fraction is actually the same as negative 9 divided by 7. You can't get that any simpler, and so that's the final answer here. Now, let me mention a couple other facts about square roots while we're here, just to make sure again that we're on the same page. First, it's very important that we understand that the square root of 49 is positive 7, not plus or minus 7. I've known some students who believe that the square root of 49 is plus or minus 7, and that's not correct. The square root of 49 is always positive 7. Now, I know why some students have this misunderstanding, and I'm going to try to actually highlight it later in this lesson. But bottom line, square root of 49 is always positive 7. Square root of 49 is never negative 7. Okay, so that's one thing we need to remember about square roots. Secondly, it's very important that we now think about the following thing with regard to square roots of negative numbers. So here's what I want to say. You've probably been told in a previous math class that you can never find the square root of a negative number, something like square root of negative 9. Now let me be very clear. That is actually a correct statement that you can't find square root of negative 9 if you understand the number system that you're working in. Usually when we're in a high school algebra math class, you're working with the set of real numbers. Remember the number line that we drew earlier on in this course when we were talking about absolute values? That number line represents the set of real numbers. You and I usually only label some of the whole numbers on that line, but the fact of the matter is that that line actually represents all real numbers. So things like 1 half, that's in there, negative 15 fourths is in there, square root of 2, pi, they're all on the real number line somewhere. In fact, any number that can be represented as a decimal number is in the set of real numbers. So the number 7, I can write that as a decimal number, 0.5, or negative 3.729451, and even things like 0.3333333 repeating, which is one third, and even square root of 2 and pi, which can be represented as infinite decimals without a really nice pattern, all of those numbers are inside the set of real numbers, which we normally represent with that number line. So if you're working in that set, then the square root of negative 9 makes no sense. You cannot find the square root of negative 9. However, today I want to expand your knowledge just a bit by thinking about another set of numbers known as the complex numbers. Sometimes people call these the imaginary numbers. The complex numbers is the, the set of complex numbers is the set of numbers which can be written in the form a plus b times i. 
where A is just some real number, and B is also a real number, and I is a very special number, the square root of negative 1. That's right, I is the square root of a negative number. Now, I can just see some of you saying, no way, you can't have that thing. Well, that's what a lot of people actually said for a few hundred years when such a number was proposed. But I'm going to show you for the next several lessons how these can actually be used. So, let me be really clear. Something like the square root of negative 1, which I'm going to call i, is not a real number. And neither is square root of negative 9. That's also not a real number. So in the past, when you've seen these kinds of things and your teacher said that they don't exist, they were right if they were talking about the real numbers. But if you and I are willing to think of this larger set of numbers called the complex numbers, then they actually exist. So that might feel a bit uncomfortable for now. Just bear with me as we walk through the rest of this lesson as we're dealing with square roots, okay? If you know what set you're working in, let's say the complex numbers versus the real numbers, if someone walks up to you and says, hey, what's the square root of negative 16? If they want you to give them a real number, you have to say, doesn't exist. But if they're okay with you making it into a complex number, then you can do that. And here's how you would. Square root of negative 16 is the same as square root of 16 times square root of negative 1. That just uses the rule we were talking about a few minutes ago. And the square root of 16 is just 4. We've known that. So now I have 4 times the square root of negative 1. And I'm saying that the square root of negative 1 equals i. And it always equals i. And therefore, my final answer is 4i. So as long as we work in the complex numbers, that would be my answer. Okay, so I've said enough about square roots for now. Let's talk about how we might use some square roots to solve quadratic equations. So let's look at the following example. I want us to solve x squared minus 36 equals 0. Now, if you remember our previous lesson, we actually saw how to solve this equation by factoring. Actually, this is an example of something I called a difference of two squares in the previous lesson. So let me suggest the following. Why don't you try factoring that equation quickly, and then we'll come back together. Okay, when you factored that, what did you get? Well, x squared minus 36 is a difference of two squares, so it factors as x minus 6 times x plus 6. And that means our equation, x squared minus 36 equals 0, can be rewritten as x minus 6 times x plus 6 equals 0. I split that into two equations, x minus 6 equals 0 and x plus 6 equals 0. And that means that my two solutions are x equals 6 and x equals negative 6. Now, I'd like to show you how to solve the exact same equation, but this time, instead of factoring, I want us to use square roots. One of the most important things about mathematics that we need to remember is that there's never anything wrong with knowing how to solve the same problem two different ways. Sometimes one way will be better than the other, but it's always good to have alternate ways of coming up with the same solution. So let me now show you how to solve this equation using square roots instead of factoring. First, I'm actually going to break one of the rules that I shared with you in the previous lesson. So don't kill me over this, but I'm actually going to start with that equation, x squared minus 36 equals 0, and I'm going to move the 36 over to the right-hand side by adding 36 to both sides. That gives me x squared equals 36. In the previous lesson, I kept telling you to move everything to the left side, move everything to the left side, and that usually does help. But in this special case, Moving the 36 to the right is actually helpful. Now, x squared equals 36 is an equation where both sides are perfect squares. And that means I can take the square root of both sides. But there's a fact that some folks miss here, and that is that the square root of x squared might be x or it might be negative x, depending on whether x is positive or negative to begin with. And so that means that when I want to go from x squared equals 36 to a new equation that uses square roots, I have to write the following. 
square root of x squared equals plus or minus square root of 36. And this is exactly where some students fall into believing that the square root of 36 might be 6 or it might be negative 6. That is not what we're saying here. It's always the case that square root of 36 is 6. But when I want to simplify an equation like x squared equals 36 by taking square roots, then I have to insert this plus or minus. And that's why that plus or minus comes up, not because the square root itself might be positive or negative. Okay, so let's finish this problem. I had x squared equals 36. I take the square root of both sides, and in doing so, the left-hand side becomes x, and I say that that's equal to plus or minus square root of 36, which is 6. And so that means I'm really writing two equations into one, namely x equals 6 or x equals negative 6. That's how I interpret the plus or minus. And guess what? That was exactly the answer we got just a few minutes ago with factoring using differences of two squares. Fabulous. So we got the same answer using two totally different methods. All right, let's try solving another equation using some square roots, and I'm going to suggest you try it first. Here's the equation. Solve x squared minus 144 equals 0. Okay, let's follow the same steps that we just followed in the previous example. x squared minus 144 equals 0. Adding 144 to both sides gives me x squared equals 144. I now take the square root of both sides, and I'll have square root of x squared equals the plus or minus square root of 144. And when I simplify that a bit, I'm going to have x equals plus or minus 12, because 12 squared equals 144. So the two solutions of this original equation are x equals 12 and x equals negative 12. Did you get those answers? If you did, you're in great shape. Now we could check those quickly just by plugging them into the original equation. Let's do that really quickly. The original equation was x squared minus 144 equals 0. Plugging in a 12 gives me 12 squared minus 144 equals 0. That's 144 minus 144, and that does equal 0, and so that one works out. So x equals 12 is definitely a solution. Let's try the negative 12. I'm going to plug negative 12 in for x, and now I see that the negative 12 is being squared. And when I do that, negative 12 squared is negative 12 times negative 12, which is positive 144. So I have 144 minus 144, which equals 0. So that equation is also true. And therefore, x equals negative 12, along with x equals 12, is a solution. Now, what have you noticed about both of the problems that we've started with? So there's something actually very special about the two examples I've just done, which gives me a hint that I can attack them with square roots. Well, you may or may not have seen it, so let me point it out to you. Both examples of the equations I just showed you were missing the x term. Did you notice that there was an x squared term? And there was a constant, uh, a 144, for example, but there was no x to the first term inside the equation that we started with. We could say it a different way. We only had perfect square terms in the equations we started with. Something like an x squared, which is a perfect square, and 144, which is 12 squared. So making that observation is very important if we want to use this tool. Using the tool of square roots to solve an equation works best when all the terms in the equation look like perfect squares. Now, it doesn't mean it can only handle those equations, but those are the equations that are best handled by using square roots. Okay, let's try a few more examples, though, where it may not be completely obvious that the square roots are going to be helpful, but let's try a few to show you how the square root tool can really help. Here's an example. Solve x squared minus 44 equals 20. Okay, what would you do here? Well, the first thing I'm going to notice, although it's a bit more complicated looking, is that there's still no x to the first term in this equation. That's a hint that I'm going to try square roots. Now, you might be saying to me, yeah, but 44 is not a perfect square, and neither is 20. 
Uh, that's true. But let's do a little manipulating to the equation. Let's kind of add and subtract some things and see if perfect squares sort of pop up. The first thing I would suggest we do is add the 44 to both sides of the equation. And when you do that, you're going to have x squared on the left equals 44 plus 20, or x squared equals 64. Ah, that 64 is a perfect square. The 44 and the 20 were trying to throw us off. But the 64 is a nice perfect square. So, and if I go with x squared equals 64 and do this square root tool with both sides, I'll have the following. I'll have square root of x squared equals plus or minus square root of 64. Remember the plus or minus is just coming in because we don't know if the x itself is going to be positive or negative after we've done all this work. So I have square root of x squared equals plus or minus square root of 64, and that's the same as x equals plus or minus 8. And once I've done that, I know that the solutions are x equals 8 and x equals negative 8. Now, I could check both of these by plugging them in to the original equation, x squared minus 44 equals 20, just to make sure we've done the problem right. I'm going to leave that to you. We've done a lot of that kind of checking in the past. I'll leave it to you. It's an important step. But let's keep moving at this point to some other examples so I can show you the variety that comes up with this square root tool. Now, let's do another example of solving a quadratic equation using square roots. Here's one. Solve x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0. Now, I have to be honest, this problem actually is very interesting to me because there really is an x to the first term in the problem, but it's hidden from us. Let me show you really quickly what I mean. If you take the left-hand side of that equation and you multiply it out, you actually get the following. x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals x minus 3 times x minus 3 minus 49, which is x squared minus 6x plus 9 minus 49, which is x squared minus 6x minus 40. That means the original equation could have been written as x squared minus 6x minus 40 equals 0. Hey, I see an x to the first term right in the middle of that left-hand side. You see that 6x? So it turns out that there was an x to the first term there. But we didn't see it in the original version of the equation. And that's not a problem. The point is that the way the original equation is written makes everything look like a perfect square. That original equation really looks like it's got a whole bunch of perfect squares in it. So I want to go back now to that original version and use the square root tool. All right? Why don't you try it first? See if you can solve that equation using square roots, and we'll check back with each other in a moment. Okay, so we're trying to solve x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0. Here's how it works. We're going to add the 49 to the other side, and we'll have x minus 3 squared equals 49. And now we do the square root tool. We take the square root of x minus 3 squared on the left, and that's equal to plus or minus square root of 49 on the right. Now that square root of the x minus 3 squared is just going to leave me an x minus 3 on the left, and the right-hand side becomes plus or minus 7. And now you and I need to be very careful about how we split this into two equations, because they're going to become the following. x minus 3 is going to equal 7, or the x minus 3 equals negative 7. That's how we split up that plus or minus so that we get the right two equations. So I have x minus 3 equals 7, or x minus 3 equals negative 7. And if I just add those 3's to the right-hand side, I'm going to have x equals 7 plus 3, or x equals negative 7 plus 3. And that means my two equations are, I'm sorry, my two solutions are x equals 10, or x equals negative 4. Now, this is an example where the two solutions don't just look like the positive and negative of one another. So we should definitely check to make sure we did this problem correctly by plugging in these two numbers into the original equation just to make sure they make the equation true. So here we go. Let's try plugging 10 into the original equation. x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0 becomes 
10 minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0. And by order of operations, I've got to do the 10 minus 3 first because it's inside the parentheses. So I'll have 7 squared minus 49 equals 0. Now I do the exponentiation, so I have 49 minus 49 equals 0, or 0 equals 0. 0 does equal 0, so 10 is a solution. Let's try the other one. I have negative 4 minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0. Remember, I'm plugging negative 4 into the original equation. Now I do what's inside the parentheses first. Negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. So I have negative 7 squared minus 49 equals 0. Negative 7 squared is the same as negative 7 times negative 7. And that'll be positive 49. When you multiply two negative numbers together, you get a positive one back. And that means you're going to have 49 minus 49, which equals 0, or 0 equals 0. That's also true. And therefore, we know that our two numbers, x equals 10 and x equals negative 4, really are solutions of the original equation. Okay, so now I actually have to be honest with you and, and let you know <laughs> that not everything has to look like a perfect square in order to use the square root tool. So let me, let me show you the following example, which is just a little bit different from the ones I've just done. Let's solve x squared minus 63 equals 0. Now, I know the x squared is a perfect square because it's x times x. But 63 is definitely not a perfect square. Ah, but that's not a problem. We can actually keep moving forward with the square root tool if we'd like. The key is that we're missing an x to the first term. And that's the real uh, hint that the square root tool is the right thing to do. So x squared minus 63 equals 0. I'm going to add 63 to both sides, giving me x squared equals 63. I just take the square root of both sides, and I'll have x uh, square root of x squared equals plus or minus square root of 63. And that's the same as x equals plus or minus square root of 63. And now you look at me and you say, yeah, but 63 is not a perfect square. What am I supposed to do now? Well, let's just simplify square root of 63 as much as we can. 63 is the same as 9 times 7. So my equation becomes x equals plus or minus square root of 9 times 7, which is the same as saying x equals plus or minus square root of 9 times square root of 7. Remember, I can split across a product when I'm doing square roots. And that simplifies to x equals plus or minus 3 square roots of 7, or 3 times square root of 7. And that means my two solutions are sitting in front of me. x equals positive 3 times the square root of 7, and x equals negative 3 times the square root of 7 when I split up that plus or minus sign. OK, I want to look at one more example, which is going to involve some of those complex numbers. I know some of you are probably feeling a bit uncomfortable right now with those. So let's do another example with the hope that you feel more comfortable with them once we're done. Here's the example. I want to solve x squared plus 48 equals 0. And since I don't see an x to the first term in the equation, I'm going to try using the square root tool. So I start with x squared plus 48 equals 0. And I now subtract 48 from both sides, leaving me with x squared equals negative 48. And now I can hear some of you telling me, hey, there's no number squared which can equal negative 48. And you would be right if you meant that there was no real number that you could square to give me a negative 48. That would be perfectly correct. So if you or a teacher said, would there be any solutions in the real numbers, the answer is that there's no solution at all. And often, in a lot of algebra classes, that's where we would stop. We would simply say that there were no solutions to the original equation. However, if we open up the set of numbers that we're allowing to be part of the solution, and we start thinking about complex numbers, then we know about the number i, which is the square root of negative 1, and that will help us find a solution. So let me use that now to finish the problem. I was at the point of x squared equals negative 48. 
I take the square root of both sides. So I have square root of x squared equals plus or minus square root of negative 48. The left-hand side becomes x. So I have x equals plus or minus square root of negative 48. Now, split negative 48 up as 16 times 3 times negative 1. Think about it for a minute. 16 times 3 times negative 1 is negative 48. And now I can split that up into the product of three square roots. And I'll have x equals plus or minus square root of 16 times square root of 3 times square root of negative 1. Now, square root of 16 is 4. Square root of negative 1, I'm just going to call this thing i. And that means I'm down to x equals plus or minus 4i times the square root of 3. Now, those are not real number solutions. I know they're not, but they are complex number solutions. They are x equals 4i times the square root of 3 and x equals negative 4i times the square root of 3. And those would be answers as long as we allow complex numbers to come into the game. Now, you might be asking, what if my teacher or a standardized test had asked me if there were solutions to that original equation? How would I answer? Well, to be honest with you, most of the time they're probably asking you for a real number solution, and that means that your answer would need to be there's no solution. But you need to be sure. If they're okay with complex number solutions, then you'd need to answer that there are two solutions, 4i times the square root of 3 and negative 4i times the square root of 3. Well, that's all the time we have for today's lesson, but let me say this before we end. I introduced today the complex numbers, and you might be thinking that these are just a waste of time. If you think that, then you'd be wrong. Complex numbers are used throughout calculus, differential equations, and a whole lot of other more math courses. Engineers use them, physicists use them, lots of people use complex numbers. So you don't want to ignore them too quickly. They often come in very handy, and they even play a key role in the development of beautiful mathematical objects known as fractals with which some of you might be familiar. Next time, we're going to talk about even another tool for solving quadratic equations, which is called completing the square. It's really helpful in finding the vertex of a parabola. That's the graph of a quadratic function. We've seen those in the past. And when you combine this tool of completing the square with the tool of square roots that we just discussed, it's extremely powerful. So I look forward to talking about completing the square in our next lesson. We talked quite a bit in the last lesson about solving quadratic equations using the tool of square roots. And while I was working through those examples, I pointed out that we wanted things to look as much like perfect squares as we could in order to use that square root tool. We even looked at one example which was written in a very special way so that the square roots worked really well. It was the equation x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0. I pointed out that this was a rewriting of the equation x squared minus 6x minus 40 equals 0, which certainly does not look like an equation on which we could have used the square roots tool. Now I hope that some of you were wondering, how in the world did he know to rewrite x squared minus 6x minus 40 equals 0 in this prettier form, x minus 3 squared minus 49 equals 0? Well, that question is exactly what motivates this lesson. The trick, or method, as I like to call it, is known as completing the square. And by using completing the square, I can rewrite such equations so that the pieces look like perfect squares. Actually, completing the square is used for more than just solving quadratic equations. It's really a way to rewrite a quadratic equation in a very special form, which tells us the location of the vertex of the corresponding parabola. Let me show you what I mean with a quick motivational example. I want us to determine the smallest value of the quadratic function f of x equals x squared plus 6x plus 42. So 
First, let me make sure that we understand what I'm asking for. The question is, what is the smallest output value of this function f of x? Or I could say it this way, what's the smallest y value of the function f of x? One way to get a feel for this is to just plug in a whole bunch of numbers for x and see what the different y values are. They, this will not tell us exactly what the smallest value is, but it should give us a hint as to what it's going to be. So let's do this and see what happens. I'm going to plug in a whole bunch of numbers for x, and I'm going to see what I get back as y values from the rule for f of x. If I plug in negative 6 and then do the arithmetic, I'm going to get 42 back as the y value. If I plug in negative 5, I would get 37 back. If I plug in negative 4, I would get 34 back. And notice that these numbers are getting smaller. Remember, I want the smallest y value possible. When I plug in negative 3 for x, I get 33 back for f of x. That's a little bit smaller. And when I plug in negative 2, I get back to 34. And when I plug in negative 1, I get 37 back as the function value or output value. When I plug in 0, I get 42, which is even bigger. And when I plug in 1, I get 49. So it looks like, at least according to the numbers I plugged in, that the lowest y value is somewhere around 33. And that occurred when x equaled negative 3. But how can I be certain that this is the smallest output value for the function f of x? Well, believe it or not, the answer can be found exactly by using this completing the square. So here's how it works. I'm going to start by looking at the first part of the equation. And by first part of the equation, I mean the x squared plus the 6x. Now, here's a question that we need to ask in order to do this completing the square. What constant would we need to add to x squared plus 6x so that I end up with a perfect square? In other words, I want a number, let's call it a, so that when I write x squared plus 6x plus a, I can factor that into a perfect square. In this case, that value of a would need to be 9. And that's because x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals x plus 3 times x plus 3 when I factor. And that is x plus 3 squared. And that's a perfect square. Now that's really helpful to see. Now let me go back to my original function, which was x squared plus 6x plus the 42. Notice that I can add and subtract 9 if I want to and rewrite this in what looks like a complicated way at first, but just bear with me. I would have x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 9 plus 42. Of course, the plus 9 minus 9 is sort of like adding 0, which doesn't do anything. But now I can regroup these numbers in an intelligent way and rewrite it with a little set of parentheses this way. x squared plus 6x plus 9 in parentheses minus the other 9 plus 42. And if I simplify the negative 9 plus 42, I have x plus 3 squared plus 33. Notice that what I've done now is written a part of this with a square plus an extra term that's hanging off on the end, the plus 33. I have successfully done what we call completing the square. But you might say to me, so what? Who cares? Well, here's why this is important. The first part of this new expression, x plus 3 squared, is never negative as long as we're plugging in a real number. And we are plugging in just real numbers here. Why? Because if you plug in a real number for x and you square, no matter what you plug in, that part will have to either be 0 or positive. And so here's what I now know. x plus 3 squared plus 33 is greater than or equal to 0 plus 33 because the x plus 3 squared part is always greater than or equal to 0 when I plug in a real number. And 0 plus 33 is 33. So no matter what we allow x to be, we know that this function is always greater than or equal to 33. Therefore, the smallest value for y that we can have for our function is 33. And this is proof 
of the conjecture, the guess that we made earlier, that 33 is the smallest value the function can take on. Now, we can also say this same fact in the language of the vertex of a parabola. So here's what we mean by that. This function that we started with is a quadratic function. And that means that its graph is either a parabola that's going up or a parabola that's going down. In this case, the number in front of the x squared is positive. It's positive 1. And that means the graph we have is a parabola with the ends going up. What is this 33? This 33 is the y value of the point that's the vertex of the parabola. In fact, I can actually take this one step further. We know both of the coordinates of the vertex thanks to the way I rewrote this problem with completing the square. Remember I had x plus 3 squared plus 33. The 33 part is the y-coordinate of the vertex, and believe it or not, the x plus 3 tells me that the x-coordinate of the vertex is negative 3. And that pattern continues on even if you look at other quadratic functions that have been rewritten with completing the square. For example, the vertex of the parabola that can be drawn from the equation y equals x minus 5 squared plus 10 is just 5 comma 10. The vertex of the parabola from x minus 3 squared minus 7 is 3 comma negative 7. The vertex from the parabola y equals x plus 1 squared plus 8 is negative 1 comma 8. And lastly, the vertex of the parabola y equals x plus 2 squared minus 17 is negative 2 comma negative 17. Basically, the x-coordinate is the opposite of the number inside the squared term, and the y-coordinate is the number that's outside the squared term. So we see that this completing the square is actually extremely helpful if we're trying to find the vertex of any parabola. That's just one reason to use completing the square, but it's a very, very important one. So we now know the main object of this lesson. I want to be able to rewrite quadratic functions so that they look like x plus a squared plus c, or possibly negative x plus a squared plus c, where a and c are just some real numbers. Once we've been able to rewrite any quadratic function that way, we can interpret the information that we're given to tell us a whole bunch about the function and also about the parabola and its vertex, which are the graph of that function. Now, let's see if you can complete the square on an example on your own, just for a moment, and then we'll work it together and see how you did. Complete the square for the following quadratic function. f of x equals x squared minus 10x minus 30. Okay, as with the previous example, I want to determine the coefficient that I would need in order to complete the square if I'm going to have x squared minus 10x plus something. Guess what? There's actually a recipe for finding that number. Here's what you do. You take the coefficient that's in front of the x to the first term, and you ignore the sign in front of it. You don't even need the sign. You just need the number in front of the x to the first term. In this example, that's 10. You always divide that number by 2. It's always dividing by 2. And that gives me 5. And then I square that 5 to give me 25. So I started with the 10. I divided by 2. And then I squared. And 10 divided by 2 is 5. 5 squared is 25. And that means this. In order to complete the square here, I need to add 25 to the x squared minus 10x. But of course, if I add 25, I need to also subtract 25 so that the overall impact is just 0. And so my original expression becomes the following. x squared minus 10x minus 30 is the same as x squared minus 10x plus 25 minus 25 minus 30. And now if you group those the right way, you'll have x squared minus 10x plus 25 
minus 55 on the outside, and that's the same as x minus 5 squared minus 55. And once you've done that, and that's all we were asked to do in this problem, you can actually interpret this even farther. You know that the smallest value that is going to be the output value of f of x equals x squared minus 10x minus 30 is equal to negative 55. That's the negative 55 that was dangling on the end after we rewrote this function using completing the square. Actually, you can say even more. You know that this function will have a graph which is a parabola. You know that the parabola is going up because the number in front of the x squared term is 1. And that means you know the range of this function. The smallest y value you can have is negative 55. And then the function is going to grow up from there all the way to plus infinity, if you want to say it that way. And therefore, the range of this function is from negative 55 up to infinity. Now, let's extend the work we just did in this example to solve an equation. So I think this is a good idea. Solving equations has been of interest to us now for a couple of lessons. So let's talk about how we can use completing the square to help us solve equations. Here's the example I want to look at. Solve the equation x squared minus 10x equals 30. Well, I know that this equation, x squared minus 10x equals 30, is the same as x squared minus 10x minus 30 equals 0. Remember, one of the rules that we often use for solving these things is to move everything to one side. Now, let's use this new equation, the way, or this rewriting of the old equation, x squared minus 10x minus 30, to solve that old equation. Well, wait a minute. You and I just looked at x squared minus 10x minus 30, and we realized that that could be rewritten as x minus 5 squared minus 55. That means that our equation that we're dealing with now can be rewritten this way. x minus 5 squared minus 55 equals 0. And now, look at what you've done. This thing is rewritten so that you don't see any x to the first terms anymore. They're now sort of hiding. And if you think about it for a moment, from the previous lesson, we now know how to finish this problem using square roots. I can now rewrite the equation as x minus 5 squared equals 55 by adding 55 to both sides. And now I can take the square root of both sides. And when I do that, like I did in the previous lesson, I'll have x minus 5 equals plus or minus square root of 55. Remember, when you take the square root of both sides like we just did, you must include that plus or minus. And now you have x minus 5 equals plus or minus square root of 55. You can split that into two equations. x minus 5 equals the square root of 55. Or x minus 5 equals the negative of square root of 55. And if you just add 5 to both sides, you'll have your two solutions. They are x equals 5 plus the square root of 55 and x equals 5 minus the square root of 55. And believe it or not, those are the two solutions for that original equation and the problem is done. And notice that those two solutions were a bit messy. Square root of 55, which doesn't really simplify very well, but those really are the final answers. And both of those are real numbers. So they really were the answers that we wanted. Now, I'd like to transition to a few more examples that demonstrate the different kinds of things that can arise in these sorts of problems where you want to complete the square. So here's the first question. What happens if the coefficient of that middle term, the x to the first term, is odd? Well, let's work through an example where that sort of thing happens. The same recipe works, but the arithmetic can get a bit messy. Here's what we need to do. Solve the equation x squared plus 7x minus 8 equals 0, and let's do so by completing the square. So remember with completing the square, the first thing you need to do is grab the coefficient of the x to the first term. In this case, it's 7. You're going to have to divide that by 2, and then you have to square. Unfortunately, since 7 is an odd number, the arithmetic is going to get a bit messy. But we can do it. Just let's work it one step at a time. Let's be patient as we work through it. The number that we want to add to x squared plus 7x in order to get a nice square term 
is going to be 7 divided by 2 and then squared. So I'm going to have 7 over 2 and I'm going to square that number. And if you do that, you have 7 halves times 7 halves, which is 49 fourths. So I need to add and subtract 49 fourths to my original equation in order to continue on. That's going to give me x squared plus 7x plus 49 fourths minus 49 fourths minus 8 equals 0. Doing a bit of that regrouping is going to give me x squared plus 7x plus 49 over 4. I need that together. Minus 49 over 4 minus 8 equals 0. Now the part that I just wrote in parentheses is the same as x plus 7 halves whole thing squared. And that's actually the point of doing the completing the square. You get that piece to be a perfect square. You still have minus 49 over 4 minus 8 and then all of that equals 0. Let's get a common denominator for those last two pieces, 49 over 4 and the 8. That common denominator is going to be 4, and that's going to give you x plus 7 halves squared minus 49 over 4 minus 32 over 4 equals 0. And the 49 over 4 with the 32 over 4 are going to combine to give you 81 over 4 so that you'll have x plus 7 squared minus 81 over 4 equals 0. Adding 81 over 4 to both sides gives me x plus 7 halves squared equals 81 over 4. And I've picked the numbers pretty carefully because 81 over 4 is 9 halves squared. And by doing that, it's a hint that I should now use this square root tool that we've talked about before. Once I have x plus 7 halves squared equals 9 halves squared, I can take the square root of both sides and I'll have x plus 7 halves equals plus or minus 9 halves. And that means you have two possibilities. Either x plus 7 halves equals 9 halves, or x plus 7 halves equals negative 9 halves. And now if you subtract the 7 halves from both sides of both of those equations, you'll have x equals 9 halves minus 7 halves, or x equals negative 9 halves minus 7 halves, and if you combine those and simplify, you're going to have x equals 2 over 2, which is 1, or x equals negative 16 over 2, which is negative 8. Now, wait a minute. At the end, we get these two gorgeous solutions, 1 and negative 8. They're just whole numbers, and they're coming from, well, where are they coming from? Because the completing the square looked pretty messy. Well, I kind of took us down a different path. Let me mention, as I have before, that sometimes you can take a different path to get to the same answer. Remember the original problem had x squared plus 7x minus 8. Well, guess what? That actually factors. We could have used that tool from a few lessons ago. x squared plus 7x minus 8 just equals x minus 1 times x plus 8. And that's where the 1 and the negative 8 come from. So, what is my point? Well, if we hadn't been forced down the completing the square route, we could have actually just used factoring, but that's okay. To find the same answer two different ways isn't a problem. In fact, I think it's a great way to confirm that what we did was right. So what's my point? My point is sometimes completing the square is useful and is the only way that you can actually solve the problem. Sometimes there are other ways, and you want to make sure you're spending the time to think about using the different tools in the right way. Because sometimes one tool will get you there a little quicker than another. Okay, now you might be thinking that the arithmetic on these kinds of problems will always be sort of clean. And uh, I can assure you, unfortunately, that it's not always so nice. Um, the example that we just did where the two final solutions turned out to be whole numbers worked out simply because that factoring was there. If the factoring had not been there, then the numbers would definitely not have been so friendly at the end. So let me show you another completing the square problem now, which has a slightly different twist. The numbers will still be okay. Sometimes the numbers get really messy. In this case, though, there really is a twist, and so let's talk about it briefly. I want us to solve the equation negative x squared plus 8x equals negative 40. Okay, so what's the twist? Well, Notice that I've put a negative sign in front of the x squared term. Oh no, what do we do? We just stop. Maybe we should just quit. No, don't do that. 
why don't you start by multiplying both sides of the equation by a negative 1? If you multiply both sides by negative 1, then whatever equation you end up with will actually have the same solutions as the one you started with. So if you multiply the original equation by negative 1, the left-hand side becomes positive x squared minus 8x, and the right-hand side becomes positive 40, because the negative of negative 40 is positive 40. And that means that the question I just asked you to do is the same as solving this equation, x squared minus 8x equals 40. Why don't you try that first and see what you get? Okay, this time I'm going to use completing the square again. I'm just going to leave that 40 on the right-hand side. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, we could move it over, but we don't actually have to. Let's now complete the square using the x squared minus 8x. Okay, what do we need to add to x squared minus 8x to get a perfect square? Well, we take the 8, divide it by 2 to get 4, square that to get 16. It's the same recipe as before. So I need to add 16. But if I add 16, I've got to subtract 16 in order to make everything balance. And that means I'm going to write x squared minus 8x plus 16 minus 16 equals 40. Grouping the plus 16 with those other two terms at the front will actually give me x minus 4 squared minus that extra 16 equals 40. Let's swing that negative 16 to the right-hand side, and I'll have x minus 4 squared equals positive 16 plus 40, which is the same as 56. And now you can take the square root of both sides. And you'll have x minus 4 equals plus or minus square root of 56. Don't forget the plus or minus. And once you've done that, you can split this into two equations. x minus 4 equals square root of 56, or x minus 4 equals the negative square root of 56. And adding 4 to both sides of both of those equations gives me x equals 4 plus the square root of 56, or x equals 4 minus the square root of 56. Now we ought to clean those square roots up just a bit. 56 is the same as 4 times 14, so square root of 56 is square root of 4 times square root of 14, and square root of 4 is 2. And therefore, my two solutions are really x equals 4 plus 2 times the square root of 14, and x equals 4 minus 2 times the square root of 14. Unfortunately, 14 doesn't have any perfect squares in it, so I can't clean that square root up any farther. But those really are my two solutions. 4 plus the 2 times square root of 14, and 4 minus 2 times the square root of 14. Now, let's look at another twist, which feels a bit similar to that negative coefficient in front of the x squared term, but it's slightly different. So again, I want you to see all of these different ways that the problems can look. Here's, here's the example I want us to look at. Solve the equation 2x squared minus 12x minus 14 equals 0. Now, notice that I've got that 2 in front of the x squared. This is the first example where I've put a positive number, other than 1, in front of that x squared term. So what do I do? Well, you don't actually want to start by dividing that 12 that's in the middle in front of the x term by 2 and going from there. I know that was sort of the first step we've been looking at, but actually, that first step only works if the thing in front of the x squared is a 1. Right now, the thing in the coefficient in front of the x squared is a 2. So the first thing we really ought to do is factor out a 2 from all of the terms on the left-hand side and divide it out. And when I do that, I'm going to have the following. 2 times the quantity x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. And now I can divide both sides by 2, and I'll have x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. Remember, 0 over 2 equals 0. And now here's the point. The solutions of the original equation are the same as the solutions of this new equation, x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. Fortunately, all the coefficients in that original equation were multiples of 2. So we're still working with integers in this new equation. Even if the original coefficients had not been multiples of 2, it wouldn't have hurt us. We could have still divided out that 2. It's just that the arithmetic would have become much messier. 
but we could have still divided by that too, and actually we needed to do that first. Now, can you finish solving this yourself? Solve x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. Okay, here's how I do it. I look at the 6 in front of the x, because I'm going to complete the square. I divide that by 2 to give me 3. I square that and I get 9. And that means I need to add and subtract 9. And I want to glue the plus 9 over with the x squared minus 6x. We're going to group them that way. And when I do, I'm going to have x squared minus 6x plus 9, grouped together, minus 9 minus 7. The x squared minus 6x plus 9 is the same as x minus 3 squared. By the way, that 3 is 6 over 2. That's where it comes from. And so now I have x minus 3 squared minus 9 minus 7 equals 0, which is the same as x minus 3 squared minus 16 equals 0. And if I add that 16 over to the other side, I have x minus 3 squared equals 16. And now I can pull out the square root tool from the previous lesson, and I take the square root of both sides, and I have x minus 3 equals plus or minus the square root of 16, which is 4. So I really have two equations, x minus 3 equals 4, or x minus 3 equals negative 4. And if I add 3 everywhere, I get x equals 7, or x equals negative 1. Now, you can check that these are the solutions by just plugging them back into the original equation. I'm, and we haven't done this together for a while, so let's do it here. The original equation was 2x squared minus 12x minus 14 equals 0. Let's check to see if 7 is a solution. So I plug 7 in everywhere for x, and I have 2 times 7 squared minus 12 times 7 minus 14 equals 0. That's 2 times 49 minus the 12 times 7 minus 14 equals 0 which is the same as 98 minus 84 minus 14, which is 0. And if you do 98 minus 84 minus 14, you really get 0. So you have 0 equals 0, and that value really was a solution. It really is. Now let's plug in the negative 1. And you have 2 times negative 1 squared minus 12 times negative 1 minus 14 equals 0. That's the same as 2 times positive 1, because negative 1 squared is positive 1, plus 12, because negative 12 times negative 1 is positive 12, minus 14. So you have 2 plus 12 minus 14 equals 0. And of course, that means 0 equals 0, because 2 plus 12 is 14, and 14 minus 14 is 0. So those two numbers really were the solutions, and we know that we can check that with no trouble. Well, we've seen this technique known as completing the square now. We've used it to solve some quadratic equations. We've now built a number of tools, factoring, square roots, and completing the square. But there's another tool I want to show you next time, and that's called the quadratic formula. So next time, we'll talk about that quadratic formula. I'll see you then. We've seen a number of different tools for solving quadratic equations, from factoring to using square roots to completing the square. All of these are useful in their own way, but no one of these tools can handle every quadratic equation. Turns out that the tool we will look at today does handle all possible quadratic equations. It's called the quadratic formula. I'm not going to take the time in this lesson to build the formula for you. We're just going to jump right in, talk about what the formula is, and then show how to use it. Now, before I get started with it, let me just answer one question. You might be thinking, well, why didn't you show me this in the first place? Well, that would be a good question to ask. And the answer really is that the other tools that we've already seen have really good uses in their own way. I would hate for you to just have this one tool to solve all the possible questions on all the possible quadratic equations you're going to see. And this quadratic formula, although extremely useful, can be a bit cumbersome at times. So the other tools that we've already seen really are useful. Now, with that said, let's talk about this quadratic formula. Here's exactly what it says. If you start with an equation of the form 
AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero, where A, B, and C are just some real numbers, then the solutions of that equation are exactly given by this. X equals negative B plus the square root of B squared minus 4AC, all divided by 2A, and x equals negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. It's that simple. And you say, simple? That looks really complicated to me. And I wouldn't blame you for saying that sort of thing. In fact, for some students, it's extremely hard to memorize this formula correctly with all of those letters floating around. If this is the first time you've seen the quadratic formula, I don't blame you for being a bit hesitant. But the beauty of it is that it provides a surefire way of solving any quadratic equation that we can write down. Now, you should definitely spend some time putting this thing in your memory banks. It's an excellent tool for what I like to call our algebra toolbox, and you really want to know it well. Now, let's start by solving a quadratic equation for which we actually don't need the quadratic formula. But by solving it with the quadratic formula and also solving it some other way, I'll be able to check to make sure that I've done the problem both ways correctly. So let's try this first. Let's solve this equation, x squared minus 11x plus 28 equals 0. And let's solve it first by factoring. OK, we want to find the values of x which make this equation true. And the first way I want to do it is by factoring the left-hand side of the equation. So I'm going to write down x squared minus 11x plus 28 equals x minus 4 times x minus 7. Did you get that factoring? I hope you did. Now, we've seen that already. We know how to factor. And now it means that my original equation can be rewritten as x minus 4 times x minus 7 equals 0. We then know from the rules we've seen in the past that we can split that product into two equations and write them as x minus 4 equals 0 or x minus 7 equals 0. And that simply means that x equals 4 and x equals 7 are my solutions. And I'm done. I could check those answers by plugging them back into the original equation if I wanted. But instead of checking it that way, I'd like us to redo this problem, not with factoring, but with the quadratic formula. And then if we get the same answers, we'll be very confident that we have the right solutions. So let's go back to the original equation. x squared minus 11x plus 28 equals 0. If I want to use the quadratic formula, I have to be able to make sure my equation is in the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So what are the values of a, b, and c in this example? Well, the value of a is 1. Remember, there's a 1 in front of that x squared. It's just that we don't typically write it down. What's the value of b? It's negative 11. Don't lose that negative sign. It comes along in the value of b. So b really is negative 11. And the value of c is just 28. It's positive 28. Then the quadratic formula tells me that the solutions are given by the following. x equals the negative of negative 11 plus the square root of negative 11 squared minus 4 times 1 times 28, all divided by 2 times 1. That's one solution. And the other one is the negative of negative 11 minus the square root of negative 11 squared minus 4 times 1 times 28, again divided by 2 times 1. Now, those look messy right now, but once we get into the practice of it, simplifying these things isn't so bad. So let's practice by simplifying the first of these a bit, and let's see what we get. We have x equals the negative of negative 11, which becomes positive 11, plus the square root of negative 11 squared minus 4 times 1 times 28 divided by 2 times 1. That means x equals 11 plus square root of 121, that's the negative 11 squared, minus 112, 
That's 4 times 1 times 28. And the denominator is just 2, because that's 2 times 1. And now this cleans up even more. x is now 11 plus the square root of 9, because 121 minus 112 is just 9, all divided by 2. The square root of 9 is just 3, so x equals 11 plus 3 divided by 2, or 14 divided by 2, or 7. Wait a minute, 7 was one of the solutions we got a few minutes ago. That's fabulous. So what looked really messy at first, just a few moments ago, actually worked its way down and simplified to just the number 7. Now, let's try the other solution. Let's make sure that it simplifies to the right value. So the other solution that the quadratic formula tells us we have is x equals the negative of negative 11 minus square root of negative 11 squared minus 4 times 1 times 28 divided by 2 times 1. And that simplifies to 11 minus the square root of negative 11 squared minus 4 times 1 times 28 divided by 2 times 1. And now, this simplification starts to feel a lot like the one we did a moment ago. We now have 11 minus square root of 121 minus 112 divided by 2, or 11 minus square root of 9 divided by 2, or 11 minus 3 divided by 2, which is 8 divided by 2, which is 4. By the way, now that we've done one set of those, I want you to notice that those simplifications actually felt a lot like one another. So you'll start to see some commonalities as you're working through the two solutions from the quadratic formula, and it should speed up your work just a bit. Now, did you notice that that x equals 4? That was the other solution that we found a few minutes ago with the factoring technique that we used. So we've now seen that factoring and the quadratic formula gave us exactly the same answers. And that gives us confidence that we're on the right track with this quadratic formula. Now, I'd like to move to a second example, just the same idea, really quickly, although we're going to complicate it ever so slightly by wiggling the original equation just a bit. Here's the example I want us to do. Solve the equation x squared minus 7x minus 14 equals 5x plus 10. Now, the first thing we need to do before we ever get started with this problem is to get the equation in standard form, which is just a fancy way of saying that we need to move everything over to the left-hand side so that the only thing on the right-hand side is a zero. So if I start with my original equation, x squared minus 7x minus 14 equals 5x plus 10, and I subtract a 5x from both sides, and I subtract 10 from both sides, and I simplify, I'm going to have x squared minus 12x minus 24 equals 0. Now, notice that what we're left with now is a quadratic equation. There really is an x squared there. And because of that, we know that we can use any of the tools that we've been learning about in the last few lessons. You might want to try to factor this, but guess what? It's not going to work in this case. Take my word for it. If you try factoring that equation, you'll be there a long time because it's not going to be as clean as the factorization we saw a moment ago in the previous example. So, instead of trying factoring, let's attack it with the quadratic equation instead. Now, in the notation of the quadratic formula, we need to know what a and what b and what c are. And in this example, a is going to be 1 again, because there's just a 1x squared. b is going to be negative 12 and c is going to be negative 24. Don't forget to include those negative signs with any of these numbers. As long as the number in the equation was negative, then we need to make these numbers with the quadratic formula negative as well. Now, plug in everything and simplify. In fact, I would suggest right now you stop the video, plug in those values, try this yourself, and see what you get. Okay. Now, the solutions of this equation are going to be x equals negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, and x equals negative b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And we already know that a is 1, b is negative 12, and c is negative 24. So the first solution that we're going to have is the following. x equals the negative of negative 12 
plus the square root of negative 12 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 24 divided by 2 times 1. And that simplifies to x equals positive 12, because negative of negative 12 is positive 12, plus the square root of negative 12 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 24 over 2 times 1. And that'll clean up uh, quickly to x equals 12 plus square root of 144 plus 96 divided by 2, which is x equals 12 plus the square root of 240 divided by 2. Now, you might stop there, but actually you can go a bit further, and I'd like us to simplify this as much as we can. So let's look at that square root now for just a second. Notice that 240 is the same as 16 times 15, or you could think of it as a 4 times a 4 times a 15, if you'd like. And 16 is a perfect square. So, using some of the rules that we've seen in previous lessons, we know that square root of 240 is the same as square root of 16 times 15, which is the square root of 16 times the square root of 15, which is 4 times the square root of 15. And now, in the simplification I had done a moment ago, I can replace square root of 240 by 4 square root of 15, because they're the same thing. And that means x equals 12 plus 4 times the square root of 15, all divided by 2, and if I factor a 2 out of that numerator and then cancel that 2 with the 2 in the denominator, I'll have x equals 6 plus 2 times the square root of 15. That number is one of the solutions of the original equation. And you should just put it to the side now. It's an important value because it is one of the solutions. But now I want us to go simplify the other solution that we're going to get from the quadratic formula. So let's do that next. We know that we have, in this second solution, x equals the negative of negative 12 minus the square root of negative 12 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 24 divided by 2a. That's a lot to say, by the way. It's long, isn't it? But we can work through it. Just take it step by step. That means x is 12 minus the square root of 144 plus 96 divided by 2 if we just do some of the simplification uh, quickly. Notice that that looks a lot like the other solution. Earlier, we had 12 plus the square root of 144 plus 96 divided by 2. And now let's simplify further. We know we have x equals 12 minus the square root of 240 over 2. We learned that the square root of 240 can be rewritten as 4 times the square root of 15. So this x is 12 minus 4 times the square root of 15, all divided by 2. And again, factoring a 2 out of the numerator, and canceling it with the 2 in the denominator gives me x equals 6 minus 2 times the square root of 15. Now, I want you to notice that the two solutions here are almost the same. They're almost identical. They actually only differ in the sign that's sort of in the middle. And some people like to write these solutions as 6 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 15. It's perfectly fine to do that, but sometimes, for some students, it hides the fact that there are actually two solutions there and not just one. So if you want to write the solutions with that plus and minus symbol in it, it's not a problem. Just remember that that is showing really two solutions and not just one. Now, at this point, I'd like to look a bit at the algebra itself and define one of the most important vocabulary terms related to quadratic equations. You may have noticed that a bunch of the simplifying we had to do occurred under that square root symbol, or under the radical symbol, as some people call it. And because of this, and because that amount that's under the radical symbol is so important, we have given it its own name. It's called the discriminant. So we're going to define the discriminant of the quadratic equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0 as the quantity b squared minus 4ac, and that's the amount that's under that square root symbol in the quadratic formula. So you might wonder, well, who cares? Why is this discriminant so important? Well, one reason is very easy to state. The sign of the discriminant immediately tells me how many real number solutions the original equation has. 
You could say it in a more graphical way if you wanted. The sign of the discriminant, whether it's positive or negative after you've simplified it, tells me how many x-intercepts there are for the parabola, which is given by y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Notice in the example that we just did, the discriminant was exactly the 240, positive 240. And because the discriminant is positive, immediately I know that the parabola that's related to that equation has two x-intercepts. In fact, you can look at a quick sketch of that graph, of that parabola, which shows us pretty quickly and pretty easily that there really are two x-intercepts. And actually, we could say a bit more. We know where those x-intercepts are. They are at 6 minus 2 times square root of 15 and 6 plus 2 times the square root of 15. And if you get a calculator out to estimate those, you'll see that the first is at negative 1.746 or so, and the other is at 13.746 or so. And if you look at the picture, that is pretty much where those two x-intercepts land. All right, let's look at another example now, and I want to see if we can solve it using the quadratic formula. Here we go. Solve the equation 9x squared plus 4x plus 8 equals 6x squared minus 4x plus 11. Okay, the first comment is, wow, that's a really ugly equation, and I would agree with you, but let's just move everything over to the left-hand side to get it in standard form, and then we'll see what we have. What we have when we subtract or add everything over to the left-hand side and simplify is 3x squared plus 8x minus 3 equals 0. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even want to start trying to factor that. I mean, we could, and we could spend some time trying to think about it, but now that we know the quadratic formula, and hopefully some of us are getting comfortable with it, I say we just use the quadratic formula. In this case, the value of a will be 3, the value of b will be, negative, will be positive 8, and the value of c is negative 3. And that means if you just plug that information into the formula, the solutions are x equals negative 8 plus the square root of 8 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 3, divided by 2 times 3, because the a value is 3. And the other solution is x equals negative 8 minus square root of 8 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 3, all divided again by 2 times 3. Let's simplify that first solution now. It's going to be negative 8 plus the square root of 64 plus 36, all divided by 6. Notice that we got a plus 36 there because we took minus 4 times 3 times negative 3. And that all simplifies to x equals negative 8 plus square root of 100 divided by 6. And the square root of 100 is pretty straightforward. It's just 10. So we have x equals negative 8 plus 10, all divided by 6, which is 2 over 6, which is 1 third. And that's not such a bad solution. Okay, it's not a whole number. It's just a nice friendly fraction, though. x equals 1 third. Well, what's the second solution? Well, again, we go back to that quadratic formula, and we have the following x equals negative 8 minus square root of 8 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 3, all divided by 2 times 3. Don't forget that 3 that's in the denominator, because a equals 3. And you'll have x equals negative 8 minus square root of 64 plus 36, all divided by 6, which is x equals negative 8 minus the square root of 100 over 6, which is x equals negative 8 minus 10 over 6, that's negative 18 over 6, which is negative 3. So the two solutions in this example are x equals 1 third and x equals negative 3. So even though we started with a pretty ugly equation, the solutions aren't so bad. In fact, let me just make a couple comments here. One is that original equation, after we had simplified it and put it in standard form, really could have been factored, but okay. But a second comment to make is, look at the graph of this equation. y equals 3x squared plus 8x minus 3. Do you see where the x-intercepts are, the two places where the graph crosses the x-axis? One of them is clearly at negative 3, or it's certainly very close to it. It really is at negative 3. And the other one is at 1 third. And so those two x-intercepts are given to us as the solutions of the original 
equation. And one more comment. That discriminant, you remember? The value under the square root sign. What was it? It was 100 before we did any simplification of the square root. We had square root of 100. So the discriminant itself is just the 100. And since 100 is positive, we knew that we had two x-intercepts or two solutions to the equation. Now, here's a good question you might want to ask. Can the discriminant ever not be positive? I mean, come on, you've shown us several examples now where the discriminant was always positive. Well, in fact, that's a very good question. The discriminant sometimes can be something other than positive. So, let's look at an example where that happened. Let's solve the equation x squared plus 12x plus 36 equals zero. And let me give you a quick task to do. Why don't you start by calculating the discriminant for that equation? Okay, the discriminant here, remember, is b squared minus 4ac. That's the quantity that's under that square root in the quadratic formula. b in this case is 12, and a is 1, and c is 36. Well, let's calculate this discriminant and see what we get. It's b squared minus 4ac, which is 12 squared minus 4 times 1 times 36. And when you simplify that, you get 144 minus 144, which is 0. Wait a minute. 0, that's the discriminant. And in fact, it is. That's not positive, though. Remember, 0 is not a positive number. It's also not a negative number. So that means that something different might be happening with the x-intercepts of the parabola we could draw that corresponds to this equation. And in fact, that's exactly right. So here's an important fact to remember that's motivated by this example. When the discriminant of a quadratic equation equals zero, so it's not positive and it's not negative, it just equals zero, then the corresponding parabola has exactly one x-intercept. And that means, if you want to think of it this way, the parabola just sits right on the x-axis either from above or it might be coming from below. It doesn't really cross it so much, it just sits there so that there's only one x-intercept. In fact, if you look at the original equation that we started with, x squared plus 12x plus 36, I can rewrite that as x plus 6 whole thing squared equals 0, using a little completing the square from a previous lesson. And we know that there's only one solution of the equation x plus 6 squared equals 0, and that solution is x equals negative 6. We could find that using our square root tool from a previous lesson. And that means that the graph of y equals x plus 6 squared only has one x-intercept. Well, you and I know that already because the graph of x plus 6 squared is exactly the graph of x squared just shifted to the left six units. And both of those graphs, x squared and x plus 6 squared, simply sit right on top of the x-axis. So this graph looks like this, just sitting right on that x-axis. One x-intercept because the discriminant is exactly equal to zero. Now, I've shown you an example where discriminants can be positive. I've shown you several of those, in fact. And I showed you this very unique example where the discriminant was exactly equal to zero. And now I'd like to show you one more example where the discriminant is something else. You can probably guess where we're going to go with this. Let's try the following example. Solve the equation x squared plus 7x plus 15 equals zero. And let me give you a quick task again. Why don't you calculate the discriminant first and see what you get? Okay, the discriminant, remember, is b squared minus 4ac. In this example, a equals 1, b equals 7, and c equals 15. And those are the values we would need for the quadratic formula or just for the discriminant by itself. Let's calculate that discriminant. b squared minus 4ac is 7 squared minus 4 times 1 times 15, which is 49 minus 60 which equals negative 11. And now this example shows us a third thing that can happen with the discriminant. It could be negative. And now we need to interpret what this means. 
Well, first of all, it means that the quantity that's under the square root symbol in the quadratic formula is negative, okay? Now, are we allowed to have a negative number under the square root symbol? Well, if you only want to deal with real numbers, then you can't have, you cannot have a negative number under that square root symbol. And that means that the original equation, in this example, x squared plus 7x plus 15 equals 0, has no real solutions. Okay? So that's the first important point to make. The second one is that if you think about the parabola for just a second, and you think about how many x-intercepts it has, it has to have zero x-intercepts because the equation itself had zero solutions. And that means if the parabola has zero x-intercepts, it means that the parabola never, ever touches the x-axis. It either lives above it the whole time if the ends go up, or it lives below it the whole time if the ends go down. In fact, if you want, you can make a quick sketch of the graph of x squared plus 7x plus 15, just to confirm that the graph misses the x-axis the whole time. Now, as we close today, let me recap what we know, thanks to the discriminant, which is part of the quadratic formula, when you're dealing with an equation like ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. First, remember the definition of the discriminant. It's the amount b squared minus 4ac. And that's the quantity that's under the square root symbol in the quadratic formula. Okay, that's the first thing to remember. Secondly, we know that the sign of the discriminant, whether it's positive or negative, or maybe zero, tells us something. If the discriminant of the equation is positive, then the equation will have two different real number solutions. And the corresponding parabola will have two different x-intercepts. If the discriminant of the equation is exactly zero, then the equation has only one real number solution, and the corresponding parabola will have only one x-intercept, so that the vertex of the parabola is just sitting right on the x-axis. And thirdly, if the discriminant of the equation is negative, then the equation will have no real number solutions and the corresponding parabola will have no x-intercepts so that it misses the x-axis completely. Now, one other thing can be said here. Even though that original equation has zero real number solutions when the discriminant is negative, it still has two complex number solutions. Just remember to use the fact that the square root of negative one equals i and go from there. So if your teacher or an exam wanted you to find all the solutions and allowed for complex solutions, then that negative discriminant wouldn't be a problem. You would just find answers which are complex. Now, let me encourage you to practice using the quadratic formula several times in order to nail it down. There's a lot going on in that formula and it often messes students up. Where's the A? Where's the B? Where's the C? Pluses and minuses and so on. So be careful and practice it as much as you can. Next time we'll do a bit more with quadratics, but instead of talking about equations, we'll talk about inequalities that involve quadratics. Several lessons ago, we spent a lesson considering linear inequalities. These were like linear equations, but with the equal sign changed to something like a less than symbol, or a less than or equal to, greater than, or greater than or equal to symbol. We then also talked about solving systems of linear inequalities in the process, where we would have two or more linear inequalities working together. In this lesson, I want to continue on this theme of inequalities, but I want to start solving inequalities that involve x squared terms, not just linear inequalities. So we're going to call these quadratic inequalities, thanks to those x squared terms. Let's start talking about how one would see or visualize the solution set for just one 
quadratic inequality by itself. Here's the example I want us to start with. Graph the solution set for the inequality y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21. Now I want you to notice that the right hand side is a quadratic expression since that x squared is there. So the boundary for this solution set is going to be a parabola. Remember when we were studying linear inequalities the boundary, so to speak, was a straight line. And we would break the plane into two pieces then based off of that straight line. Well, now with quadratic inequalities, the boundaries are actually going to be parabolas. So we'll draw that parabola as a boundary, and that will split the plane into a piece above and a piece below, so to speak. So, with that said, let's go back to this example now. What does this boundary graph, this boundary parabola, if you will, look like? Well, we can answer that question in a few different ways. First of all, because the sign on the x squared term is positive, I know that the parabola is going to be u-shaped, or if you will, it's going to go up. The ends will go up. Okay, so that's a start. We also see that the right-hand side of this inequality factors nicely as x minus 7 times x minus 3. And what does that mean about the intercepts of the parabola? We talked about this a couple lessons ago. They must be at x equals 7 and x equals 3. So if we just wanted to get a decent sketch of the graph and we weren't real careful about it yet, we could draw this u-shaped parabola which goes through these two intercepts, x equals 3 and x equals 7. But what if we wanted to be more precise about where this graph is actually located in the plane? Well, there's one more special point that we might go look for. Do you have an idea what that is? That's right, it's the vertex. And to get the vertex, our best bet is to use completing the square as we did a few lessons ago. Now, can you remember how to do that? Well, Let's try it here. Go back to the right-hand side of this inequality, x squared minus 10x plus 21, and try completing the square on those terms. Okay, let's do it together now and make sure that we did okay. I look at the x squared minus the 10x. I focus my attention on the 10 in order to complete the square. Do you remember what we do? We divide that by 2 first, always divide it by 2. That gives me 5. And then I square that 5 to give me 25. And 25 then needs to be added and subtracted from this expression. So instead of just x squared minus 10x plus 21, I'll have x squared minus 10x plus 25 minus 25 plus 21. Remember, plus 25 minus 25 is like adding 0, so it's like doing nothing. And then I put the 25, the positive 25, with the x squared minus 10x. And I group those together. x squared minus 10x plus 25 is exactly x minus 5 squared. And at the end of everything, then I have a negative 25 still plus 21, which is negative 4. So what I've done is I've replaced x squared minus 10x plus 21 with the equivalent expression x minus 5 squared minus 4 by completing the square. And now I know exactly where the vertex is. Can you pull it out of that information? It's going to be at positive 5 comma negative 4. And now I can plot this parabola with much more accuracy. I know it opens upwards. I know where the vertex is and I know where those two intercepts are. And if I plot that information and then carefully connect the dots, I'll see that the parabola looks like this. Now, let's say a few more things about the inequality. Remember, we were dealing with an inequality here, so we've got to think about uh, how to solve that problem. All we've done up to this point is basically draw in the boundary. First of all, this inequality that we started with is a greater than or equal to inequality, not a strict greater than inequality. And that means, just as when we were studying linear inequalities, that I'm going to draw this boundary parabola as a solid 
line, if you will, as opposed to little dashes, okay? So the graph is gonna be drawn solidly as opposed to using dashes to fill in the parabola. All right, if I had had a strict inequality so that this was just y is strictly greater than x squared minus 10x plus 21, then I would have drawn the parabola in a dashed fashion. Okay, now I've drawn in the boundary and now I just want to shade in the part of the xy plane that satisfies y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21. Well, those are going to be a set of points in the plane, and all of those points that are on the parabola are the ones where we are equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21. So now I want to know where are the points that are greater than or equal to, or I should say more carefully, where y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21. Well, it turns out here that they're the points that are sort of above the parabola. And if you're not sure of this, let's use the same technique we used in the previous inequalities lessons. Let's pick one of the points, if you will, and check to see if it satisfies the inequality. If it makes the inequality true, then that point will be in the region that we will shade. So for example, it looks like five comma zero is in this upper region that I'm claiming is the solution set, basically the piece that's inside the parabola, so to speak, and above it. Well, let's just check to see if five comma zero makes the inequality true. I'm gonna plug in x equals five and y equals zero into the original equation. Well, and not equation, inequality. I gotta be careful with that. So we had y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21, putting zero in for y, and putting five in for x everywhere gives me zero is greater than or equal to five squared minus 10 times five plus 21. And that's saying that zero is greater than or equal to 25 minus 50 plus 21, or zero is greater than or equal to negative four. Now we have to ask ourselves, is zero greater than or equal to negative four, true or false? The answer is true. And that means that this point, five comma zero, is in the solution set. And therefore, I can take the region that contains five comma zero, which is bounded by the parabola, and just shade that whole region in. And so, the solution set of this thing really is that portion. Now, notice from the graph that we drew that the origin is not apparently in the solution set. It looks like the origin is sort of on the other side of the parabola, if you will, sort of below the parabola. Let's make sure, just to be on the safe side, that the origin is not in the solution set. Let's convince ourselves of that. And that means I would want to plug in x equals zero and y equals zero into the original inequality because the coordinates of the origin are zero and zero. Okay, starting with y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 10x plus 21, plugging in zero for x and zero for y gives me zero is greater than or equal to zero minus zero plus 21, because zero squared is zero, and 10 times zero is zero. And that gives me, after simplifying a bit, zero is greater than or equal to 21. True or false? Well, that's definitely false. Zero is definitely not greater than or equal to 21. So the origin is not in the solution set. And that's a good thing, because we believed that the origin was outside of it, and that the solution set was this portion of the plane where all the points are above, if you will, the parabola. So to finish the problem, you simply shade in that piece that's above or inside the parabola, and that will be the solution set. Okay, let's look at a similar example now, just to get some practice, because these can take a little bit of time, and there are a few nuances with these examples. So let's try to get to a second one now, just to make sure we're on the right track. Let's graph the solution set of y is strictly less than 3x squared minus 24x plus 53. Now notice this is a quadratic inequality. It's definitely an inequality. I see the less than symbol. And it's a quadratic inequality because of the x squared. See that 3x squared at the beginning of the right-hand side? Okay, now, first thing I wanna do is draw in this boundary for the solution set. 
Well, it's going to be the parabola that corresponds to the right-hand side of that inequality. In this case, since the inequality is strict, since it's strictly less than, I'm going to draw that parabola with dashed lines, uh, if you will, just to remind me that the parabola itself is not part of the solution set. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. We have to draw the parabola in a dashed fashion in this example. Okay, next I see that the sign on the x squared term is positive. So just like with the previous example, this parabola is going to open up as opposed to opening down. And now I'm going to suggest that we just try to find the vertex and sketch the parabola once we know where the vertex is. And just do a quick sketch. So to find the vertex, I need to do a completing the square. And this completing the square has a little bit of an extra twist to it. So let's do it together and let's do it step by step. The parabola is going to satisfy the equation y equals 3x squared minus 24x plus 53. Now you see that 3 that's hiding in front of the x squared. I need to factor that 3 out of both the x squared term and the x term. The 53 can actually just sit out on the end. So we're just going to leave that there for a second. But I'm going to rewrite this now as y equals 3 times x squared minus 8x, and then plus 53. Remember, the 3 times the 8 is the 24. Now, I only want to focus my attention on the x squared minus 8x. In fact, if you want to put a hand over the 53 and a hand over that extra 3 and not look at them at all, that's fine by me. Just focus on the x squared minus 8x. What would I have to add to x squared minus 8x in order to make that a perfect square? Well, I would divide the 8 by 2 and get 4. I would square the 4 and get 16. So I want to add a 16 into the parentheses there so that I have x squared minus 8x plus 16 inside the parentheses. But you've added something now, so you must subtract something so that everything works out just fine. Now think about this. You added a 16, but there was an extra little 3 sitting out in front of the parentheses. That means that what you've really added is 3 times 16, which is 48. So I need to, on the end of this uh, expression, subtract a 48 next to the plus 53. I put a 16 inside the parentheses, which was the same as really adding a 48, because 3 times 16 is 48. So I must subtract a 48 in order to make everything balance. And that means after I rewrite the x squared and so on as a perfect square, I'm going to have three times the quantity x minus 4 squared minus 48 plus 53, or y equals three times x minus 4 squared plus 5. Now, I know that was a complicated bit of completing the square, but it's probably the most complicated one you could ever see. So that was a good exercise to go through. Now let's read off the vertex. Well, you've got it in front of you. It's got to be at 4, 5. Notice that the 3 that's in front of the whole thing has nothing to do with the vertex. The vertex of the parabola is just at 4, 5. It's now pretty easy to sketch the graph of our boundary parabola. I just plot the point 4, 5 in the xy plane, and then I have a parabola that has to go up. And since the vertex is above the x-axis to begin with, there are no x-intercepts. So once you have the vertex and you know the parabola goes up, just draw it in. It's no problem. But remember one thing. In this example, that parabola has to be drawn in a dashed fashion because the inequality was strict. Okay, now, once I have my boundary parabola drawn in, if you will, I just need to shade in the solution set that corresponds to all the points where y is less than the 3x squared minus 24x plus 53. So here's the question to finish the example. Where is that solution set? Well, it's either in the part that's sort of above the parabola, if you will, or it's in the rest of it, which I'm going to call below the parabola. It's a bit of a stretch of the term, but it's really the part that would be below if you want to think of it that way. Well, how do I know which of the two 
of those pieces is the solution set. Well, I'm going to do the same trick that I've done several times now with inequalities. I'm going to pick one special point that's in the plane, and I'm going to ask myself, is that point in the solution set or not? If it's in the solution set, then I shade the part of the XY plane that has that point in it. If that point is not in the solution set, then I ignore that part of the plane and I shade the other part. And what's my favorite point to pick? The origin. So I'm going to pick x equals 0 and y equals 0 and plug those into the original inequality and ask myself whether I get a true inequality or not. So the original inequality was y is less than 3x squared minus 24x plus 53. Plugging in x equals 0 and y equals 0 gives me 0 is less than 3 times 0 squared minus 24 times 0 plus 53. Now why do I always pick the origin? Well, it's because it cleans up the arithmetic so quickly. Notice that the right-hand side becomes 0 minus 0 plus 53. And even I can do that arithmetic, that's just 53. So my inequality becomes 0 for the y is less than 53. Now we have to pause. Is 0 less than 53? Yeah, sure it is. And since 0 is less than 53, the origin is a solution of the inequality, which means I need to shade in the part of the plane that does include the origin. And once I do that, the final answer looks like this. Now, I'd like to solve one more such quadratic inequality by itself before we get to systems of inequalities. We haven't even done two at a time yet, but let's do one more solving of one quadratic inequality before we move to a system. Okay, here's the example I want us to look at. Graph the solution set of y is less than or equal to negative x squared plus 9x minus 20. Okay, let's say several things quickly, uh, very similar to the examples we've already done. First, the inequality is a less than or equal to, not a strict less than. So my parabola boundary will be drawn in a solid fashion as opposed to dashed. Okay, so that's the first comment to make. The second comment is that the parabola in this example is now an upside down U. Did you notice that little minus sign in front of the x squared? That minus sign tells me that this parabola is going to be pointing down, that the ends of it will be pointing down. So I need to now sketch that parabola because it acts like the boundary for the solution set. Okay, let me just suggest that we try finding the x-intercepts of this parabola, assuming that it has some x-intercepts. Remember, it might miss the x-axis completely. And once we find the x-intercepts, we'll just make a quick sketch using those and the comments that I just made about the thing having to go down. Now, the x-intercepts. We have several tools for finding the x-intercepts now, and one of them we just saw in a recent lesson, the quadratic formula. So let's actually use the quadratic formula to solve the following equation for x, and that will tell us the x-intercepts of this parabola. Here it is. Solve by the quadratic formula the following. Negative x squared plus 9x minus 20 equals 0. Why don't you try that first, and then we'll get back together and do it together. Okay, plugging in our values for a, b, and c into the quadratic formula, here's what we're going to get for those x-intercepts of the parabola, or for the solutions of this equation. x equals negative 9 plus the square root of 9 squared minus 4 times negative 1 times negative 20, all over 2 times negative 1, because a is negative 1. And the other solution will be similar. x equals negative 9 minus the square root of 9 squared minus 4 times negative 1 times negative 20 over 2 times negative 1. Let me simplify these now quickly. These are very similar to what we did in a previous lesson. First, the first solution is x equals negative 9 plus the square root of 9 squared minus 4 times negative 1 times negative 20 over 2 times negative 1, which is the same as negative 9 plus square root of 81 minus 80 over negative 2 which is the same as negative 9 plus the square root of just 1 over negative 2, 
which is negative 9 plus 1 over negative 2, which is negative 8 over negative 2, which is positive 4 because those negatives will cancel. So one of the solutions here, i.e. one of the x-intercepts for my parabola, happens at x equals 4. The other solution then looks like the following x equals negative 9 minus square root of 9 squared minus 4 times negative 1 times negative 20 over 2 times negative 1, which is the same as negative 9 minus square root of 81 minus 80 over negative 2, or negative 9 minus square root of 1 over negative 2, which is negative 9 minus 1 over negative 2. That's negative 10 over negative 2, which is positive 5. So the two x-intercepts for this parabola are actually pretty friendly. They are x equals 4 and x equals 5. And once I know that those are the two x-intercepts and I know that the parabola goes downward, I can pretty much sketch the graph of this parabola very quickly. It's going to look something like this. Now once I've done that, I just need to choose the portion of the xy plane, which is the solution set for the original less than or equal to inequality. It's either going to be the part below the parabola or it's going to be the part sort of above the parabola, if you will. How am I going to figure out which one? Try the origin again. Plug in the origin and see if it makes the in original inequality true. And when you do that, and I'll let you do it on your own, you're going to find that the origin does not actually make the original inequality true. So the origin is not in the solution set, and that means I want to shade in the part of the plane which does not include the origin in this case. And that's going to be the part of the plane which is basically below the parabola. Or some might say it sort of looks like it's inside the parabola. But of course, it's not really inside it because it goes on forever in the sort of negative infinity direction. But the point is, the solution set would look something like this with this shaded region inside and below that parabola. Now, I want to turn a corner to solving systems of two quadratic inequalities at the same time. So we've dealt with systems of linear inequalities in the past. And if you remember, the idea was we would draw in the boundary graphs. We would shade in the parts of the plane, which represented the solution sets for each individual inequality. And then we would find the intersections, the intersection points. And that intersection would be the final solution set of the system of inequalities. Well, guess what? It's the same game here with quadratic inequalities. We're going to draw in the boundaries. We're going to shade in each individual solution set. We'll look for the intersection, and the intersection will be the final answer. So let's do the following example. Solve the system of inequalities. y is greater than or equal to x squared minus 8x plus 7, and y is less than or equal to negative x squared plus 5x. Okay, let's look at the first inequality uh, first, and we see that it is going to be have a boundary which is the parabola given by y equals x squared minus 8x plus 7. Now, I could go after that with the quadratic formula. We could do all kinds of things, but that actually factors pretty quickly as x minus 7 times x minus 1. So I know that the, this equation is giving me a parabola with two x-intercepts, one of them is at positive 7, the other one is at positive 1. And I know that it's a u-shape going up because the x squared term had a positive 1 in front of it. So that can be sketched very, very quickly in this way. Now notice also that this was a greater than or equal to, so that parabola is being sketched in a solid way as opposed to in a dashed way. And the portion of the plane, which is the solution set of this greater than or equal to inequality is going to be the part that's above or inside of the parabola, however you want to think about that. So you can shade that in pretty quickly. If you don't believe me, pick a point in that region and just confirm that it makes the original inequality true. Now, I could then go to the second inequality that was in the problem and sketch its boundary parabola. In this case, that parabola will be given by y equals negative x squared plus 5x. Now, that's a parabola that's going to open downwards because of the negative that's in front of the x squared. And I know how to factor negative x squared plus 5x pretty quickly. That factors as x times negative x 
plus 5. I've just factored there using the greatest common factor. And if I look at y equals x times negative x plus 5, I can quickly see the two x-intercepts that are going to occur on this new upside-down parabola. They're going to happen at x equals 0. That's from the x term, the first factor in the factorization. And the other one will happen when negative x plus 5 equals 0. And that happens when x is positive 5. So I have two x-intercepts for this second parabola. One is at 0 and one of them is at 5, and the thing opens downward. So I can plot those two x-intercepts and plot my parabola that goes through them, and I can sketch that boundary on the same set of axes as I sketched the first inequality as well. Now, since this second inequality was a less than or equal to inequality, I want to sketch this second parabola also with a solid rather than a dashed line, so to speak. And so I'm going to do that for the boundary, and then I need to ask, where is the solution set for this second inequality? Well, since I want y to be less than or equal to this quadratic, it turns out that the solution set is the part of the xy plane which is sort of inside or below this parabola. So you can see that here. And if you don't believe it, try a point in the plane and check to make sure that that really is the solution set. Now, your graph might be getting a bit messy. You've got two parabolas, you've got pieces floating around that have been shaded in. What's the solution of the original problem, of the original system? And it is the intersection of these two shaded regions. So all you want to keep as the final answer is the intersection part, the part where the two regions overlapped. And that will be your final answer. Okay, I'd like to do one more example quickly as we close today. And I want, I want to start by seeing if you can actually graph it yourself. So here's the example. Solve the system. y is greater than or equal to x squared, as well as y is greater than or equal to x minus 4 whole thing squared. Well, thankfully, we can actually draw both of those boundary parabolas very quickly. By now, you and I have seen y equals x squared and its parabola quite often. So we should be able to draw that parabola very quickly. Its vertex is right at the origin, and it opens up. What does the graph of y equals x minus 4 squared look like? Well, that's just the graph of x squared, but it's been shifted now four units to the right. So these two parabolas both sit on the x-axis, and they just look like carbon copies of one another, one shifted four units away from the other. Now, I need to shade the solution sets of these two inequalities, both of which are greater than or equal to. So they are y is greater than or equal to the x squared, and y is greater than or equal to the x minus 4 squared. And if you've been building a bit of intuition, you might guess that the two portions of the plane, which are the solution sets of each of those two inequalities, are exactly the pieces that are above or inside each of those two parabolas. And if that was your guess, then you would be exactly right. So we shade in those two pieces, and now we need to ask ourselves, but what's the final answer to the original system of inequalities? And the answer is, again, the overlap. So the final answer here is this sort of middle portion that we get after we draw in or shade inside both of those parabolas. Well, next time I want us to start talking about some very famous quadratic equations, which are connected with some interesting graphs called the conic sections. They've actually been studied for over 2,000 years, and I look forward to talking with you then. We've spent a lot of time over the past several lessons talking about quadratic functions and quadratic equations. In this lesson and the next lesson, I want to finish our discussion about quadratic equations by talking about objects known as the conic sections. 
So to begin, let me share some brief history about the conic sections. There are four basic conic sections. Parabolas, which we know quite a lot about already, hyperbolas, circles, and ellipses. They were popularized by a Greek mathematician and astronomer named Apollonius of Perga in his book, which we call Conics. Apollonius lived from about 260 BC to about 190 BC. So these conic sections have been around at least 2200 years or so in terms of mathematical study. Apollonius was very influential in the study of these graphs. In fact, most believe that it was Apollonius who started using the terms parabola, hyperbola, and ellipse. So why are these objects called conic sections? Well, that's actually a very good question. I'm glad you asked it. The answer is a very visual one. I want you to start imagining the following. Picture a cone, like a pointed ice cream cone with the wide part on the table and the point of the cone sticking up in the air. It's sort of like an upside down cone if you were putting ice cream into it. Now imagine placing another cone on top of this one where the pointed ends are touching one another. So the opening of one cone is pointing down and the opening of the other is pointing up. This is sometimes called a double cone for obvious reasons. Now, next I want you to imagine that we take a very sharp, flat blade and cut through this cone at different angles. Depending on the angle that that blade goes through the cone, you'll end up with some sort of cross section. And those cross sections are exactly the conic sections. So we started with a cone, and that's where we get the word conic, and we're going to cut them into cross sections, and that's where we get the word sections, hence the phrase conic sections. So, for example, if the blade goes through one of the cones in a completely horizontal fashion, then the cross section will be a circle. As long as the blade doesn't accidentally go right through the place where the two pointed parts were touching one another. If you go through one of the cones and the blade is horizontal, the cross section will just be a circle. If you change the angle of the blade just slightly and you cut across one of those cones, then you'll stretch that circular cross section into something that looks a bit more oblong almost football shaped. It's not football shaped, but it is a bit stretched out. And each of those cross sections are called ellipses. A single one is called an ellipse. And I'll talk a lot more about circles and ellipses in the next lesson. Now, if you change the angle of the blade so that it's slightly steeper than the angle of the side of one of the cones, then the cross section will no longer be a closed curve like a circle or an ellipse. And what you get then is something you already know a lot about. That cross section where the angle of the cut is quite steep but not vertical is called a parabola. And we know lots about parabolas. And lastly, if you take the blade and turn it completely vertical before it goes through the cones, well, in that case, you actually cut through both parts of the double cone, and what you get looks a little like two parabolas, one sitting above the other. Well, they're not exactly parabolas, but the shape that you get, which is a U on top and a sort of upside down U on the bottom, is called a hyperbola. And in this lesson, we're gonna talk about parabolas and these hyperbolas. Now, I really want to emphasize one thing before we move on. These hyperbolas look a bit like two parabolas, one glued above the other. It turns out that the hyperbolas aren't really parabolas at all. They are sort of U-shaped, but they're very different. And by the end of this lesson, I'll explain to you the difference between the U-shapes you get with a parabola and the U-shapes you get with a hyperbola. Now, another question you might ask is, well, why are you telling us about these now? What's so important about them? Well, the answer to why I want to tell you about them now is that because 
all of the equations that have these conic sections as their graphs are quadratic equations. And you and I have been studying quadratics now for quite a while. We're very comfortable with those. Every one of the equations for a circle or for an ellipse or for a parabola or for a hyperbola has either an x squared in it or a y squared in it. And it might have an x squared and a y squared in it. And so this, this is the right time to be discussing conic sections because the algebra behind them is very quadratic. Now, let me share one last historical comment with you before we get into the actual algebra today. I have to be honest, when Apollonius and his Greek friends were studying the conic sections, the concept of algebra as we know it and as we're studying it together hadn't even been invented yet. Those early mathematicians, Apollonius and his friends, were only studying the conic sections from a geometry point of view. I'm going to try to give you a bit more about the geometry of these objects in this lesson and in the next lesson. But my focus is really on the algebra. So we'll talk a little bit about the geometry, but I really want to get to the algebra, to the equations that govern these images, that govern these graphs. Okay, let's transition now to some comments about parabolas. This lesson is mostly about parabolas and hyperbolas. I know you've talked a lot about parabolas already. We've worked through a lot of examples, so I won't drag us through too much of that in this lesson. But let me tell you how parabolas are viewed as conic sections, geometrically the way Apollonius would have viewed them. So, let me explain that geometry in the following way. I'm going to give you an alternate definition for the parabola, which doesn't say anything about its equation at all, but talks about the geometry of it. So here's that definition. It's sort of a constructive definition. Take a line in the plane, which for us would probably be either horizontal or vertical. It doesn't have to be horizontal or vertical, but for our purposes in this course, we're going to make it either horizontal or vertical. We're going to take that line and we're going to call it the directrix. Next, I'm going to choose a point in the xy plane which is not on this special line called the directrix. And that point is called the focus. So I've got a line in the plane and away from that line I have another point. The line is called the directrix and that other point is called the focus. Then the parabola is defined to be the set of all points in the plane that are the same distance from the directrix as they are from the focus. So, for example, if we let the focus of a parabola be the point 0, 1, and we choose the directrix to be the horizontal line y equals negative 1, then the graph of the parabola, which is the set of all points that are the same distance from the focus as from that directrix, looks something like this. And if you look at that, that looks a lot like the parabolas we've already seen. It looks a bit flat though, doesn't it? In fact, that parabola has the equation y equals 1 4th x squared. And it's that extra 1 4th out in front which actually makes the parabola look a little flatter than it would if the equation had been something like y equals x squared. But don't get me wrong, that equation isn't how we started to draw that parabola. Apollonius would have drawn it by first drawing the directrix and drawing that focus and then determining all the points that would have been the same distance from the focus as from the directrix. Similarly, we could have chosen as the focus the point 3, 0, and the directrix could have been the vertical line x equals negative 3. And then you would end up with a totally different parabola. It would look like the following. And the equation of that graph is x equals 1 12th times y squared. Notice the y squared there. That's the quadratic part of this equation. Notice also that we have x equals y squared as opposed to y equals x squared. And it's that switch in the relationship between x and y which is making this parabola sit sort of on its side, if you will, as opposed to opening upwards. Now, 
I'm not going to focus much of our attention, oh, pardon the pun there with focus, but I'm not going to focus much of our attention on requiring you to work with the focus and the directrix definition of a parabola. I really only wanted you to see it so that you understood how Apollonius was building them. But let me make one quick point about those equations. It's important that you notice that the equation of a parabola always has one of the variables, but not both of the variables, squared. In other words, you're going to have something like y equals something with x squared, or you're going to have something like x equals something with y squared. So only one of the two variables will be raised to the second power, and the other variable will only be raised to the first power. So that's the first comment I want to make. When you're dealing with equations, and someone just hands you a quadratic equation uh, that has some x's and some y's in it, and some of the things are raised to the first power and some of them in the second, if you want it to be a parabola, the equation then needs to have one of the variables only raised to the first power, and the other variable can be raised to the second power. That's how I know that the graph of such an equation is going to be a parabola. Now, let me make one other comment about the two examples I just uh, showed you. One of those parabolas was sitting, as I like to call it, on its side, and that parabola, you need to notice, is very different from the parabolas that are pointing up and down. And the reason is, the parabola that's sitting on its side fails what we call the vertical line test. Remember the vertical line test says that if you can draw a vertical line between or over a graph and it crosses that graph at least twice, then that graph cannot be the graph of a function. So we actually will not spend a lot of time talking about parabolas which are sitting on their sides because those parabolas are not the graphs of functions. Now, since we've spent a lot of time with parabolas and their equations in past uh, lessons, I want to move away from parabolas today and spend most of our time talking about hyperbolas. So, we've talked about parabolas today. Let's now talk about these hyperbolas. And the first thing I want to do is again walk through Apollonius's definition, which is more of a geometry type definition, for a hyperbola. So bear with me as we walk through this together. Start in the xy plane, if you want to draw a hyperbola, and pick two points in the plane. Let's give them names. Let's call them F1 and F2. I'm using the letter F, by the way, because each of those two points is called a focus of the hyperbola. In fact, this word focus is going to be used later on even with things like an ellipse. So we have F1 and F2. Each one is called a focus. The plural of the word focus is foci. So F1 and F2, when you think of them together, are called foci. Now, the hyperbola which is associated to F1 and F2 is the set of all points in the plane such that the differences of the distances from each of the points on the hyperbola to the two foci is a constant amount. Now, that's probably going to be the most complicated definition of a conic section that we're going to see with any of the four conic sections. As I said above, I don't want to focus too much of this, our attention on these geometric definitions. Instead, I'd like to talk about the algebra re related to hyperbolas. But again, let me remind you, this idea from Apollonius of the geometry is that you have your two foci, and the hyperbola then is the set of all points such that the differences of the distances is a constant. That is going to be in direct contrast to what we talk about in the next lesson with ellipses, where we look at the sums of those distances as opposed to the differences. Now, let's move away from that geometry. I love the geometry, but we're in an algebra class. So let's now look at some equations which govern hyperbolas. There's a lot to do here, and so beyond just the terminology we've already introduced, there's actually a good bit to do with the equations as well. The standard form of a hyperbola's equation always looks like one of two things. 
it either looks like x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1, or y squared over a squared minus x squared over b squared equals 1, where a and b are just non-zero real numbers. So the a and the b are actually going to be numbers. You'll have an x squared and a y squared floating around. Notice that both of them are squared, not just one of them. And from an equation point of view, you always have a subtraction in there if you've written the thing in standard form. Okay? Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference between the two equations you just told me? It sounded like you said the same thing twice. Well, from an equation point of view, the first of the equations I showed you has the x squared in front, and the y squared term is the one being subtracted. The second equation has the y squared in front, and the x squared term is the one being subtracted. But in both cases, there's a minus sign, and both the x and the y are squared. That's how you're going to tell, once you have the equation written in standard form, that you have a hyperbola as the graph. And again, that's very different from a parabola because the parabola's equation only has one of the variables squared. Now, from a graphical point of view, those equations, the two standard equations for a hyperbola, are actually very different, even though it looks like they're almost identical. Let me show you what I mean about the differences between these two equations by actually showing you an example with two different graphs. So, first of all, Let's take the equation x squared minus 9, I'm sorry, x squared divided by 9 minus y squared divided by 4 equals 1. Now, I immediately know that I'm going to have a hyperbola there because I have an x squared term and a y squared term and I have a minus. Now, the graph of that looks like this. And in contrast, I want to look at the graph of this equation, y squared divided by 9 minus x squared divided by 4 equals 1. Look at the graph now of that equation and compare it to the graph of the first. Notice that they look very different, and all we did was switch the role of the x squared and the y squared in the equations. Do you see the difference? When the x squared is the term in front and the y squared is being subtracted, the u shapes open up along the x-axis, if I may say it that way. When the y squared is in front, the u shapes then open up along the y axis. So the graph almost looks like it's getting tilted around one direction or the other, depending on which of the two equations you're dealing with. It's very important that you see that distinction, because in later problems, you're going to be handed an equation, and you'll be asked to draw the hyperbola. And you'll need to know whether the u shapes open this way or the u shapes open up and down. Okay, what else should we say about these hyperbolas? Because there's more to say. Well, there are a few very important things I want you to notice. First of all, each hyperbola has two vertices. Now remember, the hyperbola is not two parabolas glued together, but we are going to talk about these two very special points called vertices. In the case of the last hyperbola we just saw, the vertices are at 0, 3, and 0, comma, negative 3. And it's not a coincidence that those 3's are there, given that the denominator of the y squared term in that equation is 9, which is the same as 3 squared. That 3 that shows up in the vertices is exactly coming from the 9, which is 3 squared. Okay? There's one other thing I should point out about each of these hyperbolas. In the case of every hyperbola, you actually have two special lines which serve as asymptotes for the two branches of the hyperbola. What do I mean by this? What are these asymptotes? Well, these two straight lines that I'm calling asymptotes serve like walls or barriers. They act like boundaries to help the two U-shapes know where to go. In the case of the hyperbola x squared divided by 9 minus y squared divided by 4 equals 1, the two asymptotes are given by y equals 2 thirds x and y equals negative 2 thirds x. 
Where do those two and three come from? Well, nine is three squared. That's where the three comes from. And the four in the other denominator is two squared. And that's where the two comes from. In the case of the hyperbola y squared over 9 minus x squared over 4 equals 1, the asymptotes are given by y equals 3 halves x and y equals negative 3 halves x. And again, the 2 and the 3 are coming from the 4 and the 9. They're basically the square roots of 4 and 9, respectively. And that's exactly where they come from. Let's look again at the equation x squared over 9 minus y squared over 4 equals 1. Notice a couple things. See how the u-shapes seem to flatten out near the asymptote lines. That flattening of the u-shapes in a hyperbola is extremely different from the way the ends or the legs of a parabola act. The ends of a parabola do not hug or get close to a straight line. So that's a very big difference between parabolas and hyperbolas. Secondly, I want you to notice that these are not the graphs of functions. These hyperbolas are failing the vertical line test, just as I spoke a moment ago about parabolas that are sitting on their sides. No matter which way you draw the branches, whether one is up and the other's down, or whether one is this way and the other one goes in the other direction, you're going to fail the vertical line test. So hyperbolas are never the graphs of functions, but they're still important and they're still useful to understand. So I don't want to ignore them completely, but I did want to point that out. Now, let me make one other comment about these asymptotes very, very quickly. I want you to know that although the asymptotes are very helpful because they serve like natural boundaries, they actually are not part of the hyperbola. So it's very important to note that if you wanted to just draw the hyperbola, you would want to draw the asymptotes in to help you see how to draw the hyperbola. But if all you wanted on the page was the hyperbola, you would actually want to erase the asymptotes because they're just there as guides or as boundaries for the actual graph of the hyperbola. Okay, as we come near the end of our lesson here, I'd like to look at a couple more examples involving hyperbolas just to make sure you've got the information down. There's a lot of terminology here today. There's a lot of differences with the equations. So let's talk a bit about graphing another hyperbola, and I want you to see if you can get a feel for what the equations are telling you when you go to draw the graph. Here's the example I want us to look at. Graph the hyperbola given by the equation y squared over 25 minus x squared over 36 equals 1. Why don't you try that one now? Okay, now let's work it through together. Notice that the equation is already in standard form. I was trying to be friendly <laughs> by putting it in that form. All we need to do is think through a couple things now about what the information is in the equation. First, will the branches of the hyperbola open along the x-axis or along the y-axis? Well, since the y squared term is the positive term here, it's the one in the front, if you will, we know that the branches will open up along the y-axis, or they'll open up and down, okay? Next, where will the vertices for those two pieces of the hyperbola be? Well, look at the denominator of the y squared term. Since 25 has a square root of 5, we know that the vertices are going to be located on the y-axis at 0, 5 and 0, negative 5. And those two points act, if you will, like the launching points for the pieces of the hyperbola. Those are the vertices. Lastly, I also know the equations of the asymptotes. They are at y equals 5 over 6 times x and y equals negative 5 over 6 times x. And the 5 and the 6 come from the square root of 25 and the square root of the 36. 25 and 36 being the denominators in the original equation. So I can start drawing my hyperbola by initially drawing the two asymptotes. I just gave you the equations of those two straight lines. I can plot those two lines. I can plot the two vertices that we just found a moment ago. And then I can draw the two pieces of the hyperbola 
coming out of those vertices so that the ends of the hyperbola pieces hug or get very, very close to those two asymptotes. They're not going to touch those asymptotes, and they're not going to cross those asymptotes as you get ready to draw the ends, but they're going to get very, very close to them so that the branches of the hyperbola actually get pretty flat looking by the time you've drawn them out at the edges. Now, I'd really like to close with one more example that adds just a little more complication, just so you can see the kinds of things you can run into as you handle these hyperbola drawing problems. So here's the example. Draw the graph of the equation 81x squared minus 9y squared equals 729. Okay, first things first. You should really ask yourself, what in the world will this graph be? I mean, 81x squared minus 9y squared equals 729. What is that? Well, I see an x squared and I see a y squared. That immediately tells me it's not a parabola because the parabola should only have one of the two variables being squared. Okay, not a parabola. I then see the x squared and the y squared with a minus sign between them, and that minus sign is a hint that this is going to be a, para a hyperbola. Fine, but now the problem is that the equation is not in standard form. What in the world do I do? Do I just quit? Of course not. Let's just do one extra step to get the equation in standard form. And the key here is this. In standard form, the right-hand side should have equals 1. Remember, it's x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. So what I really need to do here, believe it or not, in order to get this equation in standard form, is to divide both sides by 729 so that I end up with a 1 on the right-hand side. Now, let's do a little bit of arithmetic by dividing both sides by 729 and see what the simplification looks like on the equation. Well, the right-hand side is 1. We've already figured that out, but what's the left-hand side? It's going to be 81x squared divided by 729 minus 9y squared divided by 729. And 81 divided by 729 is actually just 1 ninth. So the first term in the equation is actually x squared divided by 9. And 9 divided by 729 is the same as 1 over 81. So the second term on the left-hand side is going to be y squared over 81. And therefore, my equation is actually the following. x squared divided by 9 minus y squared divided by 81 equals 1. And now we have successfully rewritten the original equation into standard form for a hyperbola. So now we're down to wanting to graph the hyperbola given by x squared over 9 minus y squared over 81 equals 1. Why don't you try graphing that for yourself really quickly and then we'll come together. Well, here's how I'd approach it. Since the x squared term is the positive term, it's the one in the front, if you will, the branches are going to open up along the x-axis now. Also, I should be able to see the vertices pretty quickly here. They're going to be on the x-axis, and they're going to be at the points 3, 0 and negative 3, 0, because the square root of 9 is 3, and the 9 is that denominator under the x squared. Lastly, can I figure out the asymptotes? Because once I know those, I've got the boundaries, basically, of my hyperbola. And the asymptotes, in this case, have equations y equals 9 over 3x and y equals negative 9 over 3x. And the 9 and the 3 are coming from the square root of 81, which is 9, and the square root of 9, which is 3. So the asymptotes are actually just at y equals 3x and y equals negative 3x. I can plot those, I can plot the vertices, I can draw the branches of the hyperbola getting close to those boundary lines, those asymptotes, and I'm done. Now, as we close this lesson, I just want to point out that parabolas and hyperbolas have lots of real-world applications. Whenever you have a chance, stare at the lens of a flashlight or the headlight of a car. You might want to make sure they're off, of course, so you don't blind yourself, but look carefully at the shape of the inside part of that light, where the light rays are getting reflected out. Do you know what general shape is often used here 
It's often a parabola. And do you know where they actually put the light bulb, or at least where they try to put the light bulb close in terms of that parabolic shape? It turns out that it's very close to the point that we called the focus earlier in this lesson. That way, the light rays are often aimed very nicely forward, and they give us the brightest light possible. Similarly, many satellite dishes are also built in a parabolic shape with the same, same kinds of goals to the headlights I just talked about so that you get the maximum uh, uh, accuracy, if you will, for the beams that are coming in. Hyperbolas are sometimes used in trying to locate objects using radio waves, and some spacecraft are purposely sent on orbits and paths which are actually hyperbolic. So these shapes are extremely important for lots of reasons. I should point out that there's more we could say about parabolas and hyperbolas. In particular, I've not shown you what happens if you move the center of a hyperbola away from the origin. That'll have to wait for another lesson. In fact, it might have to wait for another course. Next time, we're going to talk about the other two types of conic sections. Those are circles and ellipses. I look forward to talking with you then. In our last lesson, we introduced the conic sections and shared some history behind them. We also discussed how one could cut a double cone with a vertically oriented plane to obtain a hyperbola and then shift that cutting plane ever so slightly to get a parabola as the conic section instead. In this lesson, I'd like to discuss the other two conic sections, the circle and the ellipse. In fact, I want to start with the ellipse because its equation looks very similar to the equation of a hyperbola. But before I get to the equation of the ellipse, let me remind you again of how one can obtain an ellipse from the conic section's point of view. In other words, the sort of geometric point of view. If you imagine that you have a cone and a cutting plane that is just a bit off from horizontal, then you can see that the cross section that would be cut from the cone would be a closed curve. In fact, it would look a bit like a stretched out circle, and that conic section is an ellipse. So how can we define an ellipse without using this language of cutting a cone? Well, there's a really good working definition that has a geometric flavor that feels a lot like the definition we saw last time with a hyperbola. Let me give you that definition of an ellipse here. Start with two points, which I'm going to call F1 and F2. They're the foci of the ellipse. Each one by itself is called a focus of the ellipse. Then the ellipse associated to those two points F1 and F2 is the set of all points in the plane such that the sum of the distances from each of the points on the ellipse to the two foci is a constant amount. Now, this should trigger something in your memory. In the previous lesson, we saw that definition of a hyperbola, and the definition of a hyperbola is extremely similar to the definition of an ellipse. In fact, they only differ by one word. In the definition of hyperbola, that word was difference, and now in the definition of an ellipse, that word is sum. So, we need to pay attention to this sum of differences, I'm sorry, sum of distances of the points from the ellipse to the foci. And that's where the geometric definition of an ellipse is really coming from. It's amazing how that one word change changes the shape from this hyperbola with its two branches going in opposite directions to this beautiful closed curve which is an ellipse. Now, let me share one more thought about an ellipse before we actually get to the algebra of the equations. It turns out that sketching an ellipse is actually a pretty easy thing to do. Here's how you might do it. Take a piece of flat cardboard or something like that and place two push pins or thumbtacks 
into the cardboard. Those two push pins are going to serve like the foci of the ellipse. Take a piece of string, tie it into a loop, and put it around the push pins. Now, take something like a pencil and use it to push the string along until it's tight. You're basically then making a triangle, if you will, but once you've pushed that pencil in, you're actually going to build a triangle now. Now, with the goal of keeping the string from getting loose, you start moving the pencil around on the cardboard, making a mark on that cardboard. And you move it around those two push pins as much as you can. What happens? Well, the string makes your pencil draw out this elongated, it's like a circle that's been stretched out, so to speak. That shape is not a circle, but it is an ellipse. And again, those two push pins are playing the role of the two foci. And that's pretty cool. Okay, enough playing with this geometry. I still like the geometry, it's great, but we're in an algebra course. So let's try to look at some of the algebra behind each ellipse now as we move forward with these quadratic equations. The standard form of an ellipse, or I should say the standard form of the equation of an ellipse, looks like this. It's either x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1, or x squared over b squared plus y squared over a squared equals 1, where a and b are just some non-zero real numbers. And we're going to assume throughout this conversation that the value of a is always greater than the value of b. So when we look at the equation of an ellipse, a will always be bigger than b. Now I want to point out, neither a nor b can be zero because then you're going to be getting division by zero. Okay, now the difference between these two equations is in those denominators. In the first equation, the denominator under the x squared is larger because that's where I put the a squared. I put it under the x squared. In the second equation, the denominator under the y squared is larger because I put the a squared under the y squared. When you're looking at the equation of an ellipse, you want to check to make sure you can see which of the two denominators is larger. The larger of the two denominators is going to tell you something very important about the orientation of the ellipse, whether it's stretched out in the horizontal direction or whether it's stretched out in the vertical direction. Now, notice before we go on that these equations look a lot like the equations of a hyperbola. In fact, the only big difference between the two is the presence of a plus sign instead of a minus sign. That's a major key to knowing whether an equation has an ellipse as its graph or a hyperbola as its graph. So if I just hand you any quadratic equation that's got an x squared and a y squared in it, and you can see that it's in standard form, as we've been discussing, then the key you'll want to look for is whether you have a plus between the x squared and the y squared or a minus sign between that x squared and the y squared. So you might ask, what's the difference then between having a larger denominator under the x squared term versus that larger denominator under the y squared term? I already hinted that that's going to impact the orientation of the ellipse. But now let me tell you a little bit more about what I mean with that. If the a squared is under the x squared term, and remember the a squared is the larger of the two denominators, then the ellipse will be elongated or stretched along the x axis. But if the denominator under the y squared is the larger of the two, then that ellipse is going to be stretched out vertically along the y-axis. So the larger of the two denominators is telling you exactly the direction in which the ellipse is actually stretched. Okay, enough with all these variables and letters floating around and all this general talk about these equations. Let's jump into some specific examples. I think that's going to help us nail down these ideas when we get some numbers in there and we can really get our hands dirty with some of these graphs. So let's look, for example, at the graph of x squared over 9 plus y squared over 4 
equals 1. Notice that that ellipse is elongated or stretched out along the x-axis. It's stretched in the horizontal direction. That's because the larger denominator in the equation, which is 9, is underneath the x squared term. I want you to notice a few other facts, though. There are four very special points on this ellipse, and actually there are four special points on every ellipse. In this case, you've got 3 comma 0 and negative 3 comma 0, and those come from the fact that the square root of 9 equals 3, and 9 was one of our denominators. So those two points are important. You also have the points 0 comma 2 and 0 comma negative 2. And those two points come from the fact that the square root of 4 is equal to 2. And 4 was the other denominator in the equation. These pairs of points act like endpoints of two very special line segments. The longer line segment is called the major axis of the ellipse, and the shorter line segment is called the minor axis of the ellipse. So we have now these four points and these two axes inside the ellipse. Also, the endpoints of the major axis of the ellipse, in this case those are 3 comma 0 and negative 3 comma 0, have special names. They are called the vertices of the ellipse. So there's a lot going on with any one of these ellipses, and you really want to understand this terminology because a lot of this vocabulary really comes up in a variety of math books that are dealing with conic sections. Now, let's look at the graph of another equation. This time, I want to look at the equation x squared divided by 16 plus y squared divided by 25 equals 1. Now, notice that that's got an x squared in it, it's got a y squared in it, and it has a plus sign between the x squared and the y squared. That tells me that the graph of this is going to be an ellipse. And in fact, it's this very ellipse that you're seeing right now. Notice that this graph is actually stretched in the vertical direction along the y-axis. Why is that happening? Well, it's because the larger of the two denominators, in this case 25, is sitting under the y-squared term. And since the larger denominator is under the y-squared term, the stretching, if you will, happens along the y-axis. I want you to notice that the vertices of this ellipse are at the points 0, 5 and 0, negative 5. Those are both on that y-axis. And that the major axis of this ellipse is the line segment that connects those two points. Notice where the minor axis is located. It's now in the horizontal direction on this ellipse, and it's the line segment that connects negative 4, 0 to 4, 0. Notice that in both the cases we just looked at, the vertical line test was violated. In any ellipse that you draw, you can always draw a vertical line of some form that is going to cross the ellipse in more than one point. In fact, it'll cross the ellipse in either two points, or if you just use the vertical line right on the edge, it'll only cross one point. But the point here is the vertical line test is violated by every ellipse. And that means that every ellipse fails to be the graph of a function. So no matter what function you're studying, its graph can never be an ellipse. But even so, the ellipse is a very important object, and we want to be studying it as much as we can, it has a bunch of interest in its own right. Now, let's look at several more examples of equations and graphs for ellipses, just to make sure we've got all the different nuances down for these equations. So, here's one I want us to look at. Maybe you could try this one on your own before we look at it together. Determine the graph of the equation x squared over 49 plus y squared over 81 equals 1. Okay, let's talk through this for a moment. First, notice that this equation is already in standard form, and we're dealing with an ellipse. Uh, I've got an x squared term, I've got a y squared term. Uh, they're added together both on the left-hand side of the equation, and the right-hand side of the equation equals 1. So this is definitely the equation of an ellipse, and the equation is already in standard form. Next, what should you look at next? You should look at where the denominator is larger, and in this example, 
the larger denominator is under the y squared term. So this graph is going to be an ellipse which is stretched in the vertical direction along the y-axis. That means the vertices of the ellipse will be on the y-axis and they'll be at the points 0, 9 and 0, negative 9. Why are those coordinates 9s? Because the denominator there was 81 and the square root of 81 is 9. And remember, 0, 9 and 0, negative 9 are the endpoints of the major axis of this ellipse. Where are the endpoints of the minor axis located? Well, they're going to be located at 7, 0 and negative 7, 0 along the x-axis. And notice that minor axis is shorter than the major axis. Why 7, 0 and negative 7, 0? Because the denominator under the x squared term is 49, and the square root of 49 is exactly 7. That's where those 7's come from. In fact, if you think about it for just a second, if you plotted those four points, the endpoints of the major axis and the endpoints of the minor axis, and just connected the dots, knowing that you're supposed to have an ellipse, you'd get the graph that you want, and you'd see that immediately. Now, before I move to the next example, we should talk about one more term that's related to uh, an ellipse, and it's a very important one because it tells us something about the shape of the ellipse. So, let me give you that piece of terminology here. It's called the eccentricity of an ellipse, and it's just defined to be the ratio of the length of the minor axis divided by the length of the major axis. So, in the example we just did, the eccentricity would be 14 divided by 18, which of course is the same as 7 divided by 9. You see where the 7 and the 9 are coming from if you look at those endpoints of the minor and the major axis. Now, let's talk about this. What is the eccentricity actually measuring? What is it telling me? That's 7 ninths. Well, the eccentricity actually refers to the flatness or the roundness of the ellipse. I want you to think for just a minute. The eccentricity can never be bigger than 1 because it's the ratio of the minor axis length divided by the major axis length. And the minor axis is always smaller than the major axis. So the eccentricity can never be bigger than 1. But when the eccentricity is close to 1, like in the case of 7 ninths, that's pretty close to 1, then the ellipse that's related to that is going to be relatively round. It's going to be close to a circle. It won't be a circle. It'll still have some flatness to it, some stretchedness to it, but an eccentricity close to 1 means that the ellipse is trying to be close to very round. If the eccentricity is small and closer to 0, then the ellipse is going to be very flat. It's going to be stretched out quite a bit so that its width really looks quite flat in the process. So eccentricity is trying to tell me something about the flatness or the roundness of an ellipse. All right, let's look at another example now with this in mind. I think you should try this one yourself, but remember, first you need to make sure that the equation is in standard form before you can actually graph such an ellipse. So here we go. The equation I want us to look at is 2x squared plus 50y squared equals 200. Let's graph that ellipse. Okay, now the first thing you've got to do before you can graph that ellipse is get that equation in standard form. The thing that tells you it's not in standard form right now is definitely that 200 that's on the right hand side. So the way we can make that go away, go away, is by dividing both sides by 200. Now, Notice that this thing is definitely going to be an ellipse even before I divide by the 200 because I have an x squared term and a y squared term on the left hand side and they're both being added. So I know it's an ellipse, but I don't know which ellipse it is yet because I don't have the equation in standard form. Let's divide both sides of it by 200 and let's see what we get. The right hand side is simply going to be a 1, which is what we want if we want this to be in standard form. The left-hand side, after we simplify both of the fractions, is going to be x squared divided by 100 plus y squared divided by 4. 
So my equation is going to be x squared over 100 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. Now, once you have that equation in standard form, you should ask yourself, where is this ellipse going to be located? Or actually, put more directly, is it going to be stretched in the x direction or is it going to be stretched in the y direction? Well, which term has the larger denominator? In this case, the x squared has the larger of the two denominators, and so the ellipse is going to be stretched in the horizontal direction or along the x-axis since it's the x squared term which has the larger denominator. You also can tell them where the vertices are. They're going to be at negative 10, 0, and at 10, 0. Where are those 10s coming from? Square root of 100, that's right. 100 is that denominator, square root of it is 10. So the endpoints of the major axis are at negative 10, 0 and 10, 0. Where are the endpoints of the minor axis? Well, they're going to be on the y axis then. And what are their locations? Well, they're going to be at 0, 2 and 0, negative 2. Where are the 2's coming from? Square root of 4, the denominator under the y squared is a 4. So your ellipse now can be drawn quickly and it's going to look like this. Plot those four endpoints and just draw the ellipse in. Now I want you to notice something. That ellipse, once you've drawn it, is actually pretty flat. It doesn't look round. It doesn't look like it's trying to be a circle so much. Why is it flat? Well, let's look at that eccentricity that we talked about a moment ago. Notice that the eccentricity here is going to be length of minor axis divided by length of major axis. That's going to be 4 divided by 20 or 2 divided by 10 if you want to use the 2 and the 10 which are coming out of those endpoints of the axes. And 2 divided by 10 is 1 fifth which is 0.2. That number, 0.2, is closer to 0 than to 1. And that immediately tells me that the ellipse here has to be pretty flat because the eccentricity is closer to zero than to one. Okay, we've talked quite a bit today about ellipses. I'd like to turn our attention just a moment to the last type of conic section that uh, is part of the four conic sections, and that's the circle. So let's change directions just a bit now away from ellipses and talk about circles. First of all, how is the circle created as a conic section? Let's just make sure we remind ourselves of this. If you take the cone that Apollonius would have started with and you cut it with a truly horizontal plane, so the plane needs to be purely horizontal, the cross section that you would see is a circle. Honestly, for me anyway, of the four conic sections, that's the one that makes the best sense. Okay. But there's actually another cool way to think about the circle given all the things we've already talked about with an ellipse. Now, it's going to sound kind of theoretical, but just stay with me for just a second. Picture in your mind an ellipse. Remember, when I talked about drawing the ellipse on a piece of cardboard, there were two push pins that were holding the original string. Those two points are the foci of the ellipse. Now, I want you to imagine that you could lift those foci and actually move them toward one another. Now, what does that do to the ellipse? Well, one thing that it does is that it makes the ellipse less flat and more round. The foci of a flat ellipse are actually quite a ways away from one another. As you start to move those two foci towards one another, the ellipse becomes more round. So you end up with those foci closer and the ellipse trying to act more like a circle. In fact, if in theory you could move the two foci so that they're one on top of the other, basically so that there's only one focus, then the ellipse would actually become a perfect circle. So in some sense, a circle is really just a special kind of ellipse if you really only allowed yourself one focus point. I think that's pretty cool. It's pretty theoretical, but it's pretty cool nonetheless. Now, enough of that theory. Let's get right to the equations for a circle. Well, there's really only one equation for a circle. There aren't two. And the standard form of the equation of a circle, which is centered at the origin in the xy-plane, 
is given by x squared plus y squared equals r squared, where r is the radius of the circle. So, in fact, the conic section definition of a circle is that it's the set of all points which are a specific distance from the special point that we normally call the center of the circle. And the given distance, that special distance, is the radius of the circle. Now, you might still not believe me that these circles are cousins of or relatives of ellipses, so let me try to convince you in one more way. Take the equation x squared plus y squared equals 36. Now, given what I just told you about equations of circles, that is the equation of a circle centered at the origin, and the radius is 6. Uh, one error that some students make is that they might tell me the radius is 36. Remember, the radius is always the square root of that number on the right-hand side. Now, that's a circle of radius 6. What if I were to divide both sides of that equation by 36? Then I would end up with x squared over 36 plus y squared over 36 equals 1. Now, if you look at that the right way, it looks a lot like the standard form of the equation of an ellipse. But what's the difference? Well, the difference is that the two denominators of this equation are the same. They're not different. And that's what sets the circles apart. When those two denominators are the same for both the x squared and the y squared, and there's a sum in between, when those two denominators are the same, you know you don't have an ellipse, you actually have a circle. So these guys are really closely related. Their equations can be made to look very, very similar, but they have a slight difference between that circle and the ellipse. Now, let's do a few examples as we finish this lesson, just to make sure we've got this circle stuff down. First, try this one on your own. Sketch the graph of the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 49. Okay, the graph of this equation is a circle. It's got an x squared, it's got a y squared, they're being added. It's a circle centered at 0, 0, and the radius is 7, because the square root of 49 is 7. Remember, the radius is not 49, the radius is the square root of 49. So this means that points like 7, 0, and negative 7, 0, and even 0, 7, and 0, negative 7 are all on the circle. If you just plot those four points and just connect them in a nice way, you're actually going to get the circle that you want. Okay, let's look at another example pretty quickly. Sketch the graph of the equation 4x squared equals 36 minus 4y squared. Now, that's actually a pretty tricky equation, and there's a reason it's tricky, because you look at that minus sign and you might say to yourself, ah, this must be a hyperbola. But the problem is that the equation is not in any sort of standard form. Did you notice that all the standard forms had the x's and the y's all on the same side together? This equation that I've started you with doesn't have all the x squareds and the y squareds on the same side. So before you can decide whether you're dealing with a hyperbola or an ellipse or a circle here, you've got to move all of the x squareds and the y squareds to the same side. And I'm going to suggest we move them to the left side in this case. When you move the x squareds and the y squareds to the left-hand side, you get 4x squared plus 4y squared equals 36. And now you see a sum, not a difference. And that's important because it tells us something about the graph. Now, let's finish this just briefly by dividing both sides by 4. And when you do that, you'll have x squared plus y squared equals 9. And now we've uncovered from this new version of the equation that the graph must be a circle. It's definitely not a hyperbola, because I don't have a minus sign. And it's definitely not going to be an ellipse, because the coefficient of the x squared and the coefficient of the y squared are going to be the same. They are the same. And therefore, the graph of this is a circle, it's centered at 0, 0, and its radius is 3. So you can draw that pretty quickly. Now, if you've been following along, you should have a pretty good idea by now of whether a conic section's equation 
corresponds to a parabola, a hyperbola, an ellipse, or a circle, just by looking at the equation itself. So as we close this lesson, I'd like to actually have you quiz yourself and see how you do by matching some equations with their corresponding graphs. So let me give you those equations and then give you a moment to match those. Here we go. The first equation is x squared over 16 minus y squared over 9 equals 1. Next, x squared over 9 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. Then y equals x squared plus 4x plus 3. And lastly, x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. Now, let's talk through which, these, which of these correspond to the graphs. The first one, x squared over 16 minus y squared over 9 equals 1 is in standard form. The x's and y's are together on the left-hand side. Both x and y are squared, so that tells me I'm not dealing with a parabola. And there's a minus sign between the two. Which graph is that? That's got to be the graph of the hyperbola. So excellent if you found that, and that checks that one off. Next, x squared over 9 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. Okay, I've got an x squared, and I've got a y squared, and they're added together. That means I'm either dealing with a circle or with an ellipse. And notice that both the denominators are equal to each other. They're both 9. What does that tell you? That tells you you're dealing with a circle. So you should have matched that equation to the circle. Next, y equals x squared plus 4x plus 3. Now notice something here. You've got some x squareds and some x's. That's fine. You only have one y raised to the first power. There are no y squareds in this equation. That immediately tells you which type of graph you have. You must have a parabola. So that third equation must be matched to a parabola. And lastly, x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. x squareds and y squareds together on one side, they're being added together. It's got to be a circle or an ellipse. And since the denominators are different, 16 and 9, you know that this must be an ellipse. And if you got those right, it's fabulous. If not, you might want to review the graphing we've done in the last two lessons just to make sure you're on track before we move on. Well, we could do lots more of examples at this point with circles and with ellipses. We could move the center, for example, of a lot of these. But for now, I think we've done enough. So I think we'll close here. Today, we've finished the discussion of conic sections by talking about ellipses and circles. Next time, we're going to shift gears pretty dramatically and move to a totally new topic, talking about polynomials of degree greater than 2. In lots of the earlier lessons in this course, you and I have studied polynomials. When we were studying linear equations and their graphs, we were studying polynomials. And when we were studying quadratic equations and their graphs, we were also studying polynomials. So what I'd like to do today is talk more about what a polynomial is and what we know about the family of polynomials in general. So we should start by explaining what a polynomial is. In the process, I want us to also understand what a polynomial is not. So let's start with a working definition of a polynomial and use it in some examples. Here's a somewhat technical sounding definition. Just bear with me. We'll flesh it out a bit in just a moment. A polynomial with the variable x is an expression of the form a sub 0 plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 2 times x squared plus dot 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 a sub n times x to the n, where each of the numbers a sub 0, a sub 1, a sub 2, all the way up to the a sub n are all just numbers. They could be positive, they could be negative, and some of them could even be zero. And the powers on the x's are all positive integers. And it's important that we keep in mind that those exponents, as we'll call them, the powers on the x's, must always be positive integers. Now, that definition might look a bit confusing. I mean, you might have been glazing over as I was sharing it with you, but don't do that. 
Let me show you some examples to try to help you see what that definition is trying to say to us. Here are some things which are polynomials. Take, for example, 5 minus 27x. Now, that's a linear polynomial. Now, I've written it with the constant term first and then the power x to the first afterwards. That's OK. The order in which we write the terms doesn't matter. But if I'm trying to make 5 minus 27x look like the definition I shared a few minutes ago, then the 5 would be the a sub 0 and the minus 27 would be the a sub 1. Let's look at another polynomial. 4 plus 7x minus 3x squared. If you stare at that for a minute, you realize it's also a polynomial. It's a quadratic polynomial, in fact. And you and I know tons about quadratic polynomials already. And let's look at one more polynomial. Negative 3 minus 10x plus 10x squared plus 100x to the fifth. And let me just make a quick comment about that polynomial before we move forward. I could have also written that as 100x to the fifth plus 10x squared minus 10x minus 3. It would have been the same polynomial. The powers would have just gone down instead of going up. Notice that all the powers on x are positive integers. We also have that negative 3. That's a constant. That would have been sort of like the a sub 0 in the definition. But that guy really is a polynomial. Now, before I go on, let's make lots of other comments about these polynomials because they're very, very important. First of all, some of you might have seen polynomials in the past and said to yourself, I thought we were always supposed to write polynomials with the largest power first and then all of the smaller powers later. So for example, something like 4 plus 7x minus 3x squared has to be written as negative 3x squared plus 7x plus 4. That might have been what you thought. Well, it turns out it's OK to write that polynomial in either order. In fact, we could have jumbled up the terms a whole bunch and written 7x minus 3x squared plus 4. It would have been the same polynomial. So it's OK to have those terms floating around as long as we get all the terms written down for the polynomial. OK, so in fact, I probably will write most of my polynomials with the highest power in the front and then moving down to lower and lower powers of x later on. But I don't have to do that, all right? More importantly, when you write a polynomial in that way, the powers on the variables are going down. You can read that polynomial very quickly with the highest power in front all the way down to the lowest power at the end. And because of that, we're going to give that a special name. It's going to be called the standard form of a polynomial. And we often want to be able to find that highest power of x quickly for lots of reasons. We'll talk about that later. So the standard form of a polynomial is going to be very important. So the polynomial 5 minus 3x plus 4x squared, for example, is not in standard form. But its standard form would be 4x squared minus 3x plus 5. Same polynomial, but the latter is the standard form for that polynomial. And we're going to focus most of our attention on those standard forms. OK, I want you to notice that it was OK to have both positive and negative coefficients, the numbers that were in front of the powers of x. It's OK for those to be positive or negative. And you might have even noticed that some of the terms even are 0, some of those numbers in the front. We're going to call those coefficients. Remember, I looked at negative 3 minus 10x plus 10x squared plus 100x to the fifth. You might have been saying, wait a minute, where's the x cubed? Or where's the x to the fourth term? They were there. It's just that their coefficients were 0. And it's OK for a coefficient to be 0. So it's all right for coefficients to be positive. It's all right for them to be negative, And it's all right for those to be 0. Now, let me make a somewhat radical comment about polynomials. I'm just sort of kidding there. But let me talk about these coefficients a little bit more. It turns out that not only can they be positive, negative, or 0, they can also be uh, roots. They can be square roots, or radicals, as we'll call them later. So for example, square root of 3 times x to the fifth minus 1 fourth times x to the fourth plus 19x that's also a perfectly good polynomial. And I've read, read it to you in standard form, in fact. 
The key to any polynomial is not about the coefficients, because they can be anything they want, basically. It's that the exponents on the variables need to be positive integers. And that's the real key when you're trying to spot whether some function that's been handed to you is a polynomial or not. Now, I want you to notice that I said in the variable x or with the variable x when I gave the original official definition of the word polynomial. But there's actually nothing special about x. We could use a different variable if we wanted. We could have used y or z or t or anything else. So, for example, y cubed plus 8y squared plus 2y minus 17, that's a polynomial. And t to the fifth plus t to the fourth plus t plus 1 is also a polynomial. Now, some of you might be saying, well, it looks like just about anything can be a polynomial. I mean, you've written down all sorts of things already in this lesson. I don't see that there would be anything that's not a polynomial. Well, there are lots of functions which are not polynomials. And it's very important, in fact, that we be able to spot some of these functions or some of these expressions which are not polynomials. So let me now spend a few moments talking with you about some examples of expressions which are not polynomial. Here's the first one I want to look at. x to the one-third plus x plus 2. That is not a polynomial. Do you know why? Well, look at the exponents. It's always important to look at the powers on the x's. And in this case, I've given you x to the one-third. Once you have a power which is not a positive integer, and one-third is not a positive integer, then that expression, x to the one-third plus x plus two, cannot be a polynomial. So fractions for powers, they're no good if you want something like a polynomial. And also, if you think about it, square root of x can't be a polynomial then, because the square root of x is x raised to the one-half power and 1 half is not a positive integer. So something like square root of x is also not a polynomial. Okay, let's look at some other examples which are not polynomials. Take something like x to the negative 2 minus 3 times x to the negative 1. Well, the minus 3 as a coefficient in front of the x to the negative 1 is not a problem. And of course, negative 2 and negative 1 are integers, so that's good. But they're negative. They're not positive integers. And because of that, x to the negative 2 minus 3 times x to the negative 1 is not a polynomial. All right, let's look at another example. Take something like x squared plus 2x all divided by x to the third power plus 1. Now, if you look at x squared plus 2x by itself, that's a polynomial. And the x to the third power plus 1, which seems to, is in the denominator here, that's also a polynomial. But when you take the ratio of two polynomials, most of the time, almost always, that expression as a whole is no longer a polynomial. And in this particular case, it's definitely not a polynomial. So something like polynomial divided by another polynomial is almost always not going to be a polynomial. So do you think you've got it? Do you think you see the difference now between what is a polynomial and what isn't? Well, let me suggest we take a quick quiz, and I'm going to ask you to do the following. Figure out which of the following expressions is a polynomial. A, x squared plus 2x plus 3x to the negative 1 power minus 16, or B, 3x squared minus the square root of x plus 3. Or c, square root of 17 times x squared minus pi times x plus x to the 37th power minus 5 thirds. Or d, 32 divided by x minus 7. If you picked c, you got it right. Even though it looks pretty weird with all of those coefficients floating around and some pretty large exponents and so on, the key to seeing that c was the answer is that all of the exponents are positive integers. And that's all you really have to check when you're looking for a polynomial. So 
once you start to think about this definition and you see all of these examples, you see that a polynomial is a pretty particular thing. It has to be very, very special. It's not just any ordinary algebraic expression that you throw on a piece of paper. And because of that, because we're going to be kind of picky about what the definition of a polynomial is, it's going to let us say quite a few important things mathematically about polynomials. Now, before we move forward, we need to mention some other very important vocabulary terms. So the first is what's called the degree. The degree of a polynomial is the largest power on the variable that's in the polynomial. So for example, take the polynomial 14 times x to the fifth plus 23x to the fourth minus 102 times x plus 19. The degree of that is 5 because that's the largest exponent on any of the powers of x. Notice that you have to be careful when you're finding the degree because if the polynomial is not written in standard form, then the degree might actually be hiding somewhere inside one of the middle terms, if you will, of that polynomial. So let's try a quick quiz again. Can you find the degree of the following polynomials? Stop the video. When you think you know the answers, start it again. Let me share those polynomials with you. First, 1 plus 3x plus 4x squared minus 8x cubed. And secondly, 2 minus 10x plus 8x to the fourth power minus 5 times x squared. The degree of the polynomial the first one I gave you is 3, and the degree of the second polynomial is 4. Did you notice that term x to the fourth that was sort of in the middle of that polynomial? That gives that polynomial degree 4. If you got both of those answers right, you're doing great. Now, just keep in mind, as you keep moving through these kinds of examples, that the order on the terms of a polynomial is not what matters, and that degree might actually be hiding somewhere in the middle. Actually, knowing the degree is extremely important when you're ready to start graphing polynomials and you're trying to do other things with polynomials. And it's wanting to find the degree quickly which makes the standard form of a polynomial so helpful. Once your polynomial is written in standard form, you can read off the degree almost immediately because that highest power on the variable is right at the beginning. It turns out that one way to classify polynomials is by their degrees. Often people want to talk about a polynomial of a certain degree. For example, polynomials of degree 1, like 7x minus 4 or 10x plus 3, those are called linear polynomials. You and I have seen those already quite a bit. Polynomials of degree 2 also have a very special name. They're called quadratic polynomials. So, you know, 4x squared plus 2x minus 13. That's a quadratic polynomial. But there are special names for other polynomials of higher degree. For example, polynomials of degree 3 are called cubic polynomials, while polynomials of degree 4 are called quartic polynomials, and polynomials of degree 5 are called quintic polynomials. We can keep playing this sort of game of naming higher and higher degree polynomials if you want, but I say we stop here. Nevertheless, make sure you're learning linear, quadratic, cubic, quartic, and quintic polynomials. Those terms are going to be used more and more throughout the course as we try to identify what kind of polynomial we're studying. Now, there's another vocabulary term that's very common when we study polynomials, and it's called the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is the coefficient, or just the number, which is in front of the term that contains the largest power of x. So for example, if I take the polynomial 14x to the fifth plus 23x to the fourth minus 102x plus 19, the leading coefficient is the 14. That's the number in front of the x to the fifth. Now, let's look at two other polynomials and just see if you can spot the leading coefficients pretty quickly. Here are those two polynomials. 1 plus 3x plus 4x squared minus 8x cubed and 2 minus 10x 
plus 8x to the fourth minus 5x squared. The leading coefficient of the first polynomial is negative 8, and the leading coefficient of the second polynomial is positive 8. If you got those right, you should give yourself a pat on the back, because again, I was trying to hide those just a bit from you. So once you see the degree and you see those leading coefficients, the leading coefficient of each polynomial being the number in front of the power, the highest power on x, you'll be very, very well off when we're ready to start graphing in just a second. Now, I mentioned a few moments ago that one way to classify polynomials is by their degree, and we talked about linear and quadratic and cubic and so on. But there's a second way of classifying polynomials, and that's by the number of terms that they have. There are also fancy names for these, at least for a few types. So, for example, 3x squared is called a monomial because it only has one term. Think of the prefix mono, which normally means one. So think of a monomial as a one-term polynomial. In a similar way, the two-term polynomials are called binomials, and the three-term polynomials are called trinomials. So something like x squared minus 5x plus 2 is a trinomial. There's really no common name for polynomials with four or more terms, so I'm not going to try to keep pushing in that direction. But just make sure you have this idea down, because it's very important that we know how to classify these polynomials not only by degree, but by their number of terms. So with the goal of making sure we've got that down at least a bit, let's try classifying the following polynomial. 5x cubed minus 1, and I'd like us to classify it by degree and by number of terms. Well, the polynomial has degree 3. That's pretty quick. So it's a cubic polynomial, and it also has two terms in it. So it's a binomial. So you could say that it's a cubic binomial. All right, let's try classifying one more. x to the fourth minus one-third x plus two ninths. And I'd like you to try to classify that by degree and by number of terms. And I'll give you some choices. Maybe that's a quadratic trinomial, or a cubic binomial, a cubic polynomial, or a quartic trinomial. You try. Well, the answer there is the last one, the quartic trinomial. It has degree four, so it's quartic, and it has three terms, three terms, so it's a trinomial. So we would call that a quartic trinomial. Now, one of the big reasons we care about polynomials is that they provide us with a great way to build useful mathematical functions. For example, if the radius of a circle was called x, then the area of that circle can be defined as the function a of x equals pi times x squared. And that's a quadratic monomial, right? But now you could treat that as a function. What do I mean by that? Well, if I came to you the next day and I asked for the area of the circle, which has radius 13 feet, you could tell me by evaluating the function a of x at the number x equals 13. Or to say it in slightly less fancy language, you could just plug 13 in for x in the function a of x equals pi x squared and tell me what the area will be. If a of x is pi x squared, pi times x squared, then a of 13 is pi times 13 squared, which is just pi times 169. And if we use an approximation for pi like 3.14, then we can get a pretty decent approximation for this area. A of 13 is about 3.14 times 169, which is about 530.66 square feet. Now, why might that be helpful? Well, if I'm building an above ground pool that is circular and has a radius of 13 feet, then I know the footprint of that pool, the amount of area it's going to take up in my back lawn. It's going to take up about 530.66 square feet. And that means I need to get enough sand to put under that pool to make sure the footing is nice and soft while I walk on my pool to cover at least 530 square feet. But, but this function a of x is even more helpful than this. Why? Well, maybe my kids come to me later that night and they say, Dad, we saw an even bigger pool on TV today. And it's also circular, but it has a radius of 21 feet. Could we buy that one instead? 
Now, I actually have a thousand square feet that I could use for this pool in my back lawn. Now, maybe you and I could work together to figure out if this bigger pool is going to fit. Let's try using that function a of x, remember it's pi times x squared, and see if this pool will actually fit. Why don't you think about this for a moment after we talk it through a bit, you might want to stop the video and see if you can finish the problem. Here's what we have so far. A of x is pi x squared, so a of 13 is pi times 13 squared, which was pi times 169, and using 3.1 as an approximation for pi, I saw that that was 530.66 square feet. What would I do if the pool has radius 21 feet? Try to see if you can determine what the area is going to be that's going to be taken up. Well, does it fit? If I want that area of the footprint to be no more than 1,000 square feet, I can go back, take A of X, and plug in the new radius, 21 feet, and see if I get the area that I want. Well, A of 21 is pi times 21 squared, which is pi times 441. And if I use 3.14 again as an approximation for pi, and I multiply that by 441, I'm going to get 1384.74 square feet. Unfortunately, I don't have that much square footage in the back. I only had a thousand square feet. So I have to go back to my kids and say, sorry, we can't get that bigger pool. We can't go from a radius of 13 feet to a radius of 21 feet because we got a much larger area than the one that we really have available to us. Now, the point here is that the function a of x equals pi x squared is extremely helpful because if I wanted, I could now try several other values of x for the radius of a, this pool, and I could see if I could get a slightly larger pool, maybe bigger than 13-foot radius, but smaller than a 21-foot radius, to see if I could fit that pool in. So this function is very helpful as I try to evaluate this area for several values of x. Now, I'd like to look at a few more examples of evaluating polynomial functions. And evaluating simply means plugging numbers in and seeing what you get as an output. So let's try the following, and you might want to try it yourself just to see how you do with evaluating functions. Here's the problem. Determine f of 0, f of 1, f of 2, and f of negative 1 for the function f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 3x plus 5. Well, what did, you, what did you get? Let's see how everything worked out. f of 0 equals 2 times 0 to the fourth minus 3 times 0 plus 5. And now you have to do order of operations. So I need to do that 0 to the fourth first. But that, of course, is just 0. So f of 0 really is 2 times 0 minus 0 plus 5, which is 0 minus 0 plus 5, which is just 5. So f of 0 is 5. We've just evaluated the function f of x at x equals 0. What about f of 1? Well, it's 2 times 1 to the 4th minus 3 times 1 plus 5, which is 2 times 1 minus 3 times 1 plus 5, or 2 minus 3 plus 5, which is 4. So f of 1 is 4. How about f of 2? f of 2 is 2 times 2 to the 4th minus 3 times 2 plus 5. We must do that exponent first, and we'll have 2 times 16 minus 3 times 2 plus 5 which is 32 minus 6 plus 5, which is 31 once you do all of the uh, subtraction and addition. So f of 2 is 31. And lastly, f of negative 1 is 2 times negative 1 to the 4th minus 3 times negative 1 plus 5. Negative 1 to the 4th is actually positive 1. The power of 4 will cancel out the negatives because negative 1 to the 4th is negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. And so we have 2 times positive 1 minus 3 times a negative 1 plus 5, which is 2 plus 3 plus 5, or 10. So f of negative 1 equals 10. Now, before we look at one more example of evaluating a polynomial, let me point out a very practical reason why it's useful to be able to do such an example. We just showed that f of 0 equals 5 just a moment ago. And that means that the graph of f of x 
equals 2x to the fourth minus 3x plus 5 must go through the point 0, 5. 0 was the x value we plugged in, and 5 was the y value that came out. So that means the graph must go through the point 0, 5. And now we know that it also goes through 1, 4 and 2, 31 and negative 1, 10 given the information that we just built a moment ago. And one of the best ways to sketch the graph of a function is just to plot a bunch of the points. We just found four points, in fact, in that example. And then just connect the dots. So evaluating a polynomial function quickly at several values of x can be very, very helpful when we're trying to visualize the graph of a function. Now, here's one with a little bit of a twist in it. So I'm going to ask you to try it first. You might want to grab a pencil. You might want to stop the video once I share the example with you. Try it yourself, and then we'll go from there. Here's the example. Evaluate g of x equals x cubed minus 4x at the values x equals negative 2, x equals 0, and x equals 2. Now, if you tried that on your own, you might be scratching your head a bit. Let me walk through it with you, just in case you are. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're fine, and we'll see what these values are. But let's see what we get g at negative 2, or g of negative 2, is equal to negative 2 cubed minus 4 times negative 2. And that's the same as negative 8, because that's negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, minus 4 times negative 2, which is the same as negative 8 plus 8, which is 0. Ah, so what I'm really seeing here is that the point negative 2 comma 0 is on this graph, or the graph goes through that point, that's an x-intercept of this graph because the y value equals 0. Okay, let's now evaluate g at the value x equals 0. g of 0 is 0 cubed minus 4 times 0, which is 0 minus 0, which is 0. Well, wait a minute, that gives me a second x-intercept then. It's right at the origin, 0 comma 0. Now let's plug in 2. Let's evaluate g at the value x equals positive 2. And you'll have g of 2 equals 2 cubed minus 4 times 2, which is 8 minus 4 times 2, which is 8 minus 8, which is 0. Now, wait a minute. That's a third x-intercept. It's at the value 2 comma 0, or at the point 2 comma 0. Could that be correct? Could the graph of g really have those three x-intercepts? Well, in fact, if you stare at a sketch of that graph, you'll see that g of x really crosses the x-axis at x equals negative 2, x equals 0, and x equals 2. Our calculations were actually correct. But this now reminds me of some of the language we brought up several lessons ago, which was related to functions. Remember how we talked about the domain of a function and the range of a function? The domain was a set of legal inputs, and the range is a set of outputs for a function. What can we say about the domain and range of a polynomial of any kind? Well. Actually, we can say a whole lot. First of all, no matter what polynomial function you're studying, it turns out that the domain is always the set of all real numbers. In other words, there are no illegal values of x to plug in to a polynomial. What can we say about the range? Well, it turns out that the range of a polynomial actually depends on something. It depends on the degree of the polynomial. If the function's degree is odd, then it turns out the range is all real numbers. Go back and look at the graph of g of x that we just looked at a moment ago. Notice that one branch goes upwards forever, and the other branch goes downwards forever. And that tells us that the range is actually the set of all real numbers. And this is always going to be true of a polynomial with odd degree. If the polynomial has an even degree, then something different happens. Either both branches go up or they both go down. And because of this, there's going to be a piece of the range that's actually missing, so to speak. The range will not be the set of all real numbers. So when the degree of a polynomial is even, we're going to have a range that's some portion of the set of all real numbers. Maybe something like minus 1 to infinity, or 3 to infinity, or minus infinity to 2, or something along these lines. Well, today we've talked about polynomials in general, and we've introduced a whole bunch of vocabulary terms about polynomials. 
I hope you'll review those as we go on, or before you go on, really, because I'm going to use those vocabulary terms in the future. Next time, we'll talk about the graphical side of polynomials and discuss a variety of examples there. In the previous lesson, we began talking about polynomial functions in general, and we referred to a few facts about their graphs. In this lesson, I want to take this graphical discussion much further. My hope is to develop a number of general principles or tools that we can use whenever we want to draw the graph of any polynomial function. One thing we can say is that the graph of a polynomial never breaks and it never has a sharp corner. The fancy mathematical phrase for this never breaking is that a polynomial function is always continuous. But you don't have to worry about that phrase for now. In fact, you won't really need to worry about continuity until you get to a calculus course. So, for example, here are the graphs of a few polynomials. And I want you to notice that these don't break and they don't have a sharp corner. For example, here's the graph of x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. It's a nice smooth curve, goes up, comes down a bit, goes back up. No breaks, no sharp corners. Let's look at another. x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 2x. And again, notice that we've got some curvature to it and so on. We've got some parts that are going down, parts that are going up, but no breaks and no sharp corners. This is the important point for now. How about another? Let's take a really complicated looking polynomial. 1 over 200 times x to the 6th minus 29 divided by 200 times x to the 4th minus 3 over 25 times x cubed plus 43 over 50x squared plus 6 fifths x. Okay, that's a pretty complicated polynomial. Maybe the most complicated one we'll see in the whole course, I don't know. But notice its graph. Even though the polynomial is such a mess, the graph never breaks, and it never has any sharp corners. And this is important, because every polynomial will have those two properties. I think that's a pretty cool looking graph, to be honest with you. But now I want you to compare the graphs that we've just seen with graphs of some things that are not polynomials. So for example, let's take a pretty uh, straightforward function. x raised to the 2 thirds power. Now this is not a polynomial. Do you remember why? Remember, the powers, or the exponents as we call them, on all the powers of x, on all the variables x, need to be positive integers. And 2 thirds is not a positive integer. So x to the 2 thirds is not a polynomial. Notice that sharp corner right at the origin. If you look really, really carefully at what's happening close to the origin, you'll see that it's not a nice smooth U-shape there's actually a, cor a corner that's coming in, a sharpness that's happening right at the origin. No polynomial graph would ever do such a thing. Let's look at another function. x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1. Now this is also not a polynomial. Remember I said in a previous lesson that almost always if you take one polynomial and divide it by another polynomial, you will not have a new polynomial. And that's the case here x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1 is not a polynomial. And notice its graph. It's actually in three distinct pieces. There's a piece up in the first quadrant, a piece up in the second quadrant, and then there's this sort of U-shape down at the bottom. Those three pieces are broken away from one another. And so if I walked up to you with that graph and showed it to you and said, could this be the graph of a polynomial? your answer would immediately be no, because no polynomial graph will have pieces that are broken up away from one another. Okay, so we know that the graphs of polynomial functions are going to be nicely behaved. There are no breaks. There are no sharp corners. Everything is going to be nice and smooth throughout the entirety, the whole graph of a polynomial. Now, 
Let's remember what I said at the end of the previous lesson about polynomial functions in general. First, the domain of any polynomial is the set of all real numbers. That, by the way, is part of the reason that you don't have any breaks in the graph of any polynomial. And secondly, the range of a given polynomial depends on its degree. If the degree is odd, then the range is going to be the set of all real numbers. And if the degree is even, then both ends of the graph are going to go in the same direction. They'll either both point up or they'll both point down. And because of that, the range is restricted. You might even look back at the polynomials I showed you just a few minutes ago to see what happens whether the degree was odd, in some cases it was there, or the degree was even in other cases. So every real number is in the domain of any polynomial function. You're allowed to plug in any real number you want into a polynomial. This is very important. It's not true of some other functions that you know. For example, you cannot plug x equals negative 2 into the function f of x equals 1 divided by x plus 2 because that would cause division by 0, and division by 0 makes no sense. So x equals negative 2 is not in the domain of f of x equals 1 over x plus 2. But of course, 1 over x plus 2 is not a polynomial either. Similarly, if you want the output of a function to stay in the real numbers, and you don't want to include complex numbers, then the number x equals negative 5 is not in the domain of g of x equals square root of x. Why? Because square root of negative 5 is not a real number. So that's another example, square root of x, where the domain is not the whole set of real numbers. But square root of x is not a polynomial either. Any polynomial, no matter what polynomial you choose, is not going to have problems like division by 0. It's not going to have problems like having a negative number under a radical symbol. Every real number you want to plug in will be in the domain of a polynomial function. So that's very important. You can actually plug in any value you want. And from a graphical perspective, for a polynomial function, that means that there aren't any gaps in the graph. There are no parts of the x-axis where the graph somehow disappears or breaks apart. And that's very, very important as you get ready to graph a polynomial. OK. What else can we say about the graphs of polynomials? We've said several things already, but there's actually more that we can say as we walk through these ideas about graphs of polynomials. We can talk about the number of x-intercepts of a polynomial. And it turns out that the number of x-intercepts of a polynomial depends on the degree of the polynomial. In fact, the number of x-intercepts of any polynomial you choose is at most the degree of the polynomial. I'm going to talk about this more in some later lessons, but for now, just trust me on this as we want to talk about these graphs. I want to be able to use this fact. The number of x-intercepts never has to equal the degree. In fact, sometimes it does. But it's not required to be equal to the degree. It's just the case that the number of x-intercepts needs to be less than or equal to the degree of the polynomial. So, for example, here are the graphs of several polynomials of degree 4. I want you to notice that you could have 0 x-intercepts, or you could have 1 x-intercept, or maybe 2 x-intercepts. You could even have 3 x-intercepts for a degree 4 polynomial, or you could have 4 x-intercepts. Here are some examples. Take f of x to be x to the fourth plus 2. This is a degree 4 polynomial, and it has 0 x-intercepts. The graph lives completely above the x-axis. OK. Take a function like f of x equals x to the fourth. Now, this is also a degree 4 polynomial. It's also a monomial. Remember that language from the previous lesson. And f of x equals x to the fourth has exactly one x-intercept. It's the origin. No problem there. Take f of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1. It's a perfectly gentle fourth degree polynomial. In that case, it would be a fourth degree or quartic trinomial because it has three terms. And x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1 has exactly two x-intercepts. Okay. 
Take another one. Take f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 4x squared. Also a quartic polynomial, a degree 4 polynomial. In this case, a quartic binomial. And it has exactly three x-intercepts. So now I've shown you quartic polynomials that have 0, 1, 2, or 3 x-intercepts. Now take something like f of x equals 2x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 1. And in this case, you'll now have four x-intercepts. So now I've shown you some examples where you could have anywhere between 0 and 4 x-intercepts for a degree 4 polynomial. They can range. You can have any of that that you want. But I do want to point this out. I would never be able to have five x-intercepts for a degree 4 polynomial. So this gives me at least some sort of boundary, if you will, on the number of x-intercepts I'm allowed to have. I can have anywhere from 0 up to the degree of the polynomial. And that's helpful if I want to start graphing a polynomial. Now, a little bit more can be said about these graphs of polynomials. So for example, the ends of the graphs of a polynomial never flatten out. They never go to the point where they can't get above a certain y value. They keep going on, either going up to plus infinity or going down to negative infinity. Maybe both go up or both go down or one or the other, but the ends can never flatten out. So they must go up to plus infinity or down to negative infinity. Also, if the degree of the polynomial is even, then either both of the ends go up or both of the ends go down, sort of like a parabola. Remember, degree two polynomials or quadratic polynomials have parabolas as their graphs, and both ends of a parabola either go up or they both go down. The upness or downness, if you will, is determined by the sign of the leading coefficient, just like with parabolas. So if I'm looking at, say, a degree four or a degree six or a degree eight, polynomial, all of which would have even degree, the ends of those polynomials will either both go up or both go down depending on the sign of that leading coefficient. Now you can see why I cared so much about the leading coefficient. If the degree is odd for any polynomial, then one of the ends is going to go up and the other end is going to go down. And the sign of that leading coefficient is going to tell me whether the end on the right is going down, and the end on the left is going up, or vice versa. Now, it's important then that you keep in mind the degree of the polynomial, whether it's even or odd, and you look at the sign of that leading coefficient. Because those two facts are going to tell you something about what's happening to the ends. And I have to make this point very clear. What I just said about the degree of the polynomial, and the sign of that leading coefficient only tells us something about the ends of the polynomial. There might be all sorts of things going on in the sort of middle of the graph of the polynomial. All we know from the degree, whether it's even or odd, and the sign of the leading coefficient is what's happening on the ends. But that's still helpful. If you really want to know what's happening on the sort of edges, so to speak, of the graph, those two facts will help you tremendously. The hard part really, is what's happening in the middle of that graph. Now, how is it that we really know for sure, with certainty, that the end behavior that I just told you about depends on this leading coefficient in such a strong way? Well, it's because the term containing that leading coefficient is what I like to call the dominant term in a polynomial. Now, that's not really an official term, so to speak, but it's a very important idea that I want to talk about for a few moments. Because this dominant term, the term that holds that leading coefficient, is really playing the role of deciding whether both ends are going to go up, both ends are going to go down, or one end will go up and the other will go down. Now, let me try to explain what I mean by this dominance of that one term by looking at a quick example. Consider the cubic trinomial 4x cubed plus 9x squared plus 3. When we're talking about the end behavior of a polynomial, we're talking about what's happening to the graph when x is large. And I don't mean x equals 100. I mean something like x equals 100 million 
or maybe even bigger, like x equals 100 billion. But for now, let's do this. Let's plug in x equals 100 million into the polynomial I just mentioned to you, and let's do it one term at a time, and let's see what's happening. Now, stay with me as we walk through this. The first term was 4x cubed. I want to plug in 100 million. Can you imagine how far down the x-axis we are when we plug in 100 million for x? We're way out there to the right. When you plug in 100 million into 4x cubed, you're actually going to get 4 times 100 million cubed, and that's a 4 followed by 24 zeros. Okay? That is a large number. Imagine if you had that many dollars or pennies even. It would be a lot of money. Now, let's take the second term in this polynomial. It was 9x squared. And let's plug in 100 million for x there. And there you would have 9 times 100 million squared. And if you do that, you're going to have a 9 followed by 16 zeros. Now, that's also a pretty big number. I'll give you that. A 9 followed by 16 zeros, that would be a very large number as well. Now, the third term in this polynomial is 3. And of course, that has no x's in it, so the 3 is just a 3. <laughs> That's what you get when you plug in 100 million. That term is just a 3. Now, I want you to think about these numbers for a second. I realize that the first two are pretty big, but I want you to understand that that first number is much, much bigger than the others. It has more zeros in it by far than the second term. So bottom line, that first term, 4x cubed, is going to dominate the other terms when the values of x are huge. So when you actually see what the polynomial equals when x equals 100 million, you're actually going to get a 4 followed by 7 zeros and then a 9, and then several more zeros followed by a 3. You see that that first term, the 4, followed by 24 zeros is really what made the difference here. Yeah, the other terms played a role, but that first term really is the biggie. <laughs> it's the dominant one. So it's true that the end behavior, what's happening when the x values are either really, really big in the positive direction or what's happening in the other direction, that end behavior is completely dictated by the term containing that leading coefficient. Now, let's spend a few minutes looking at the graphs of some very specific polynomial functions. And I want to focus some serious attention on the graphs of cubic, quartic, and quintic functions. So let's jump to this example. Sketch the graph of the cubic monomial function uh, that is f of x equals x cubed. It has one term, that's why it's monomial, and it's degree 3, so it's cubic. Now, this is a basic function. It's just one term. But I want to talk about everything we know that we've talked about up to this point about the graphs of polynomials. First, there's just one x-intercept. It's pretty clear. It's at 0, comma, 0. Well, if you wanted to know where the x-intercepts were, and you weren't sure if there were any, or if 0, 0 was the only one, you would have to set the whole function equal to 0 and solve it for x. That's what you do to find x-intercepts for any function. And that means you'd be looking at the equation x cubed equals 0. And now, if you think about it for just a moment, if you took the third root of both sides, and we'll talk about roots later on in later lessons, you're going to just get x equals 0. You could think about this from other directions as well. But bottom line, you're just going to have one x-intercept. It's going to happen at x equals 0. So we have the point 0, comma 0. We could plot that if we wanted on a piece of graph paper, and we could move on. Now, what can we say about the end behavior of f of x equals x cubed? Well, if you plug in a positive value of x, like something like x equals 10 or x equals 100, what do you get? Well, f of 10 is 10 cubed, which is 1,000. That's getting kind of big. And f of 100 is 100 cubed, which is 1 million, a 1 followed by 6 zeros. So you see that as x is getting large and positive, the y values are also getting large, and they're getting large pretty fast, and they're staying positive. And that means that the part of the graph that's on the right side of the plane, or the right side of the y-axis, if you want to think of it that way, is going to go upward towards plus infinity. Okay? 
What if we evaluate this same function at negative values of x? In other words, x equals negative 10 or x equals negative 100. Well, let's see what happens. f of negative 10 is negative 10 cubed, which is negative 10 times negative 10 times negative 10. And notice that one of those negative signs is going to survive all the cancellation. And the output value you get there is negative 1,000. So that means that the point negative 10 comma negative 1,000 is on your graph. What if you plug in negative 100, which is even farther out? Well, negative 100 cubed is actually negative 1 million. And that means the point negative 100 on the x-axis, negative 1 million on the y-axis is the point in question there. That means that the left-hand side of this graph is going to behave very differently from the right-hand side. That the y values on this side are now going to go to negative infinity. So one side is going up and one side is going down. Remember I said earlier, if the degree of the polynomial is odd, one side goes up and one side goes down. That's exactly what we're seeing here. Now if you just plot some points and connect the dots, and this is always a good idea when you're not sure, plot a few points, connect a few dots, you'll see what the graph looks like. You could have the point zero, zero. We already talked about that. And then if you plug in things like one, you'll get one back. Plug in two and you get eight. Three and you get 27. How about negative one? Well, that'll give you a y value of negative one. Plug in negative two and you'll get negative eight back. Plug in negative three and you'll have negative 27 back. That gives you a whole bunch of points very quickly. And if you connect those dots, you'll see exactly what, we're want what you want to see, basically, which is the function y equals x cubed just has this nice smooth shape going down to negative infinity on the left, going up to positive infinity on the right, makes this nice smooth curve that goes right through the origin. Now, let me share a quick thought with you about cubic graphs. Often, people think that all cubic graphs will have a certain S shape to them, as I like to call it, with one hill and then one valley, and then it'll take off from there. Well, it's true that lots of cubic graphs, or lots of cubic polynomials, I should say, have a graph that looks something like that, with one hill and one valley. But it's not the case that they all have to look like that. Notice that the graph of f of x equals x cubed, which you and I just drew a moment ago, doesn't have that kind of a shape. There is no sort of hill followed by a valley and so on for f of x equals x cubed. Part of the reason is because that graph only has one x-intercept, while in some of the typical hill and valley graphs for cubic polynomials, you actually have three x-intercepts. But my point is this. Don't think that all graphs of all degree three or cubic polynomials have to have the same sort of shape. It's just not true. And it's not true of all quartic functions, and it's also not true of quintic functions as well. Now, let's use some of the ideas we learned in a previous lesson to find the graph of some other cubic functions. Let's take the following. Sketch the graph of the cubic function g of x equals x cubed plus 4. Well, we know that this graph has to look like the graph of f of x equals x cubed, the graph that you and I just drew a few moments ago. It's just that the graph of this new function is translated by four units. Now, do you know which direction? It could be going left, it could be going right, it could go up or down. Which one is it? Well, if you take the graph of x cubed and you translate that graph up four units, that will give you the graph of x cubed plus four. So that graph is actually pretty easy to draw. Okay, let's try to sketch a different graph of a cubic again, but let's try to see it in an intelligent way so that we can draw it quickly. Sketch the graph of h of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1. Now, for some of you, your first reaction is going to be, yikes, that looks really complicated. And honestly, I would agree with you. But I know a little secret, not necessarily something I expect you to know, not yet. And that is this, x cubed minus 3x squared plus 3x minus 1 actually can be factored as x minus 1 times x minus 1 times x minus 1, which is the same as x minus 1 cubed. I promise I'll show you in a later lesson how I got that, 
But the point is that this function h of x is just x minus 1 cubed. And I know how to draw x minus 1 cubed from the graph of x cubed. Do you remember how to do it? When you replace x by x minus 1 in a function, it means that you translate the graph of the original function to the right exactly one unit. So the graph of this h of x is actually pretty straightforward to draw once you know the graph of x cubed. You and I saw that a moment ago. If we now take that graph and just move it to the right one unit, then I'll have the graph of h of x, and it'll look something like this. Okay, to close out this lesson, let's look at the graph of a certain quartic polynomial. Okay, so it's quartic. That means it's degree 4. So here's the function I want us to look at. Sketch the graph of f of x equals x to the fourth minus 9x squared. Okay? I'm going to use this as example to try to motivate some of the things we're going to do in the next few lessons. So just bear with me as we do this. First of all, it turns out that I can factor f of x equals x to the fourth minus 9x squared in a nice way, right? I see that I can pull out a common x squared from both terms. And again, we'll talk about this in the next few lessons. And once I do that, it turns out the factorization of f of x becomes x squared times x minus 3 times x plus 3. For now, you're going to have to just take my word that that's really true. I promise to talk more about how to do that factoring in the next few lessons. It really will come up. But for now, I just want to say this is a fancy example of a difference of two squares that we saw some lessons ago. I promise, though, we'll talk about this more in detail later. Now, what does that factorization of this function tell us? Well, it tells us where the x-intercepts of this graph are. They must be at the places where each of the pieces of that factorization equals zero. Well, the x squared equals zero exactly when x is zero, and the x minus 3 equals zero exactly when x equals 3, and the x plus 3 term equals zero exactly when x equals negative 3. So I actually know that there are three x-intercepts here. 0, 0, 3, 0, and negative 3, 0. Remember the rule we had a few minutes ago. Degree 4 polynomial can have at most four x-intercepts. In this case, I'm only actually going to have three. Now, let's talk about the end behavior of this quartic polynomial. Well, I've got to focus on the dominant term. Remember, we talked about this dominant term a few minutes ago. It's the term which actually is the one of highest power. In this case, that's the x to the fourth. It should be clear that no matter whether you plug in a positive number or a negative number for x, the result from x to the fourth is going to be positive. That power of four, which is even, is going to cancel out any negative sign that's part of the x because that 4 is even. So even if you plug in negative 10 for x, when you raise that to the fourth power, the y value is going to be positive. And that means that both of the ends of this graph are going to go up, because the y values always have to be positive. Now, we should plot some points now just to see if we can get a picture, if you will, of the general shape of this graph. And this is always a good idea to do. So maybe we could plug in x equals 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and 5. And maybe x equals negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and negative 5 would also be a good idea. By the way, we already plugged in x equals 0 and found that it was 0. Remember, there's an x-intercept at the origin here. And in fact, you already know what happens at x equals 3 and x equals negative 3 as well. You actually had three points already in your pocket. But once you plot these points and you carefully draw where they are on a set of graph paper, on a piece of graph paper, you would have a graph that looks like the following. And to be honest, this idea of plotting points and connecting dots, it might feel a bit childish or easy to do, but it's a great idea. And I strongly encourage you to go through the work of plotting some points and connecting the dots. Now, as I close this example, let me say this. 
you might be left feeling like we should have had a way to do this, uh, to find this exact graph, if you will, instead of just finding a few special points and plotting a whole bunch of other points. It turns out that there are many other things we could have done to find this graph. But most of the math that you and I would need to apply these tools would actually come from calculus, believe it or not. Things like the derivative. You may have heard some people talk about the derivative if they've taken a calculus class. Those tools are very important for helping us find graphs. And they're useful. But we don't have those yet. That's all right. If you stick with your math, however, when you do get to calculus, you'll see some of these beautiful and very useful tools for finding graphs. And I promise you won't be disappointed at that point. Now we spent a good deal of time talking about the visual or graphical aspects of polynomial functions in this lesson. Next time, we're going to talk more about the algebra side of polynomial functions, how to combine them in different ways, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and something called composition. I'll talk about that then.